Okay, cool. Everyone see my screen? Good, perfect. Okay, one second. What is it? What is it? All right. Okay, so today we're going to talk about um, ADHD, attention deficit uh, disorders. All right, so just to clarify, the we're gonna, the three subjects we're going to cover for the second exam is going to be schizophrenia, all right, ADHD, and anxiety. Any questions? All right, before we move forward, anyone have any questions with schizophrenia? Anything I need to review? Anything that wasn't clear? All right, just so you know, I, I am going to be, okay, number one, this could be good news for everybody. I wrote the whole exam, all right? All 50 questions are made by me. So if you guys watch my lectures and you read everything you need to read, you should do very well in the exam, all right? I'm I'm gonna, I have a lot of questions on there about the dopamine pathways, a lot of questions on there about pharmacokinetics, uh, pharmacodynamics, make sure you know the serotonin receptors, 5HC2A particularly, 5HC1A particularly, all right? Uh, also know the difference between a partial agonist, all right? so. Partial agonists, do you guys know? What are the three partial agonists? A, B, C. Aripiprazole, right? Abilify is one. Brexpiprazole, Rexolti is two, right? And Curiprazine, Braylar is three, all right? Know the difference between an atypical antipsychotic, right? Which is a second generation antipsychotic and know the difference between a first generation antipsychotic, all right? Remember, first generation antipsychotics, less metabolic symptoms, right? But more EPS. So that would be dystonia, akathisia, Parkinsonism, right? So a lot more motor side effects. And remember, what pathway is, is implicated by that? That would be the nigrostriatal pathway, all right? So if I ask you in a test question, someone is taking antipsychotic, what dopamine pathway is affected? You should know nigrostriatal area, all right? If someone is complaining about weight gain from an antipsychotic medication, you probably wouldn't want to give them a second generation, right? So a first generation would be good, all right? There's numerous first generations, but definitely no haloperidol, Definitely no flufenazine, prolixin, all right? Those are two of the main ones. Copromazine, thorazine is another one, okay? Know a lot about clozapine. There's a bunch of clozapine questions on there, right? If you have any questions about clozapine, you can ask me today. Clozapine is, is one of the most recommended antipsychotics for treatment-resistant schizophrenia. We use that usually after two trials of a failed antipsychotic medication, right? For example, someone's tried Abilify, he's still psychotic, it doesn't work. You switch them to Risperidone, it still doesn't work. Okay, so the third trial sh probably should be clozapine if you know that they're taking the medication, all right? You could, you could validate that by doing blood work, right? You can do plasma drug levels of risperidone, plasma drug levels of Abilify. And of course, if it shows that it's therapeutic and they've been taking the medication, then that would mean they've earned the right to take clozapine. All right, questions? Okay, let's move on to ADHD. Okay. This is just a small example. So uh, G protein linked, right? D2, 5HC2A. Remember, 5HC2A is gonna be in a GABA interneuron, all right? So if it's activated, what's gonna happen? GABA is gonna release and it's actually gonna inhibit the release of neurotransmitters, right? So if you give someone a 5HC2A antagonist, it's actually gonna increase dopamine, right? Because it's gonna disinhibit it. So dopamine will increase in the frontal lobe and dopamine will also increase in nigrostriatal layer. So what would you notice there if you give someone a 5HC2A antagonist? Less what? Less, if someone gets a medication, remember I told you 5-HC2A is going to help with side effects, right? Because it's implicated in alleviating side effects of some medications. If you give someone a 5-HC2A antagonist, it's actually going to re release dopamine in the frontal lobe, which would what? Increase cognition, right? So not as much as like a stimulant, but it could increase cognition, let's say if someone has bipolar disorder or someone who has schizophrenia, right? Or it might also increase dopamine in the nigrostriatal area so that someone's not gonna have extra primal symptoms, right? They might not have stiffness, they might not have cogwheeling, they might not have akathisia, all right? No upregulation, downregulation. I think I have one or two questions on there about that. So know that if you block a receptor, what's gonna happen to the postsynaptic receptor? You block it, what's gonna happen? Is it gonna upregulate or downregulate? Upregulate. Up right, because you're blocking it, the neuron wants homeostasis, it's craving the receptor being innervated, so it's going to upregulate, right? Because you're blocking it. The opposite. If you're agonizing a receptor, right, and it gets hit too much in order to protect itself from 
neurotoxicity is going to downregulate, right? Or become less sensitive. That's important. Make sure you know that. Make sure you know the agonist spectrum. Like I said, we're going to be talking about agonists today. All right. We didn't really talk much about agonists last time because we we're talking about schizophrenia, right? Usually you give someone an antagonist for schizophrenia or, you know, um, bipolar disorder, right? Partial agonist, like I said, partial agonist works two ways. So remember, a partial agonist, when a receptor is being innervated too much, what's going to happen? It's going to work as a what? Antagonist or agonist? Let's say if someone has too much dopamine in their mesolimbic area, they're psychotic. Antagonist. It's going to work as what? Antagonist. Very good. Yep, it's going to work as a net antagonist. All right, so it's going to compete at that receptor. So imagine you can only have one chemical bound to a receptor, right? You can't have two chemicals bound at the same time. So what's going to happen is the affinity for that partial agonist is going to be stronger. So it's going to bounce off whatever's in there. It could be dopamine. It could be cocaine, right? But the partial agonist is going to go. Once it sticks onto that receptor, it has higher affinity, which means that it's it's most likely to stick on it and not get down stop. Therefore, it's going to work as an antagonist, right? As long as that partial agonist is on that postsynaptic receptor, nothing else can go in that receptor, right? Unless you give them another medication that has a higher affinity for that, right? But we can talk about that later on. Antagonist, right? Dopamine blockers, 5-2A, right? Those can have effects also. Inverse agonist, we do have a few in psychiatry. Pemavanserin is one. And the other one is clozapine is a histamine inverse agonist. But that's not significant, right? Really know what pharmacokinetics versus pharmacodynamics is. I did ask a bunch of questions on that, how you distinguish them. Pharmacokinetics is kind of how your body works against the medication, right? It has to do with metabolism, distribution, absorption, excretion, all right? Know the CYP enzymes, okay? Remember, we talked about a few of them last time. 3A4 is the most common you see in medicine. 2D6, the most common you see in psychiatry. 1A2 is important because that's clozapine, olanzapine, haldol, a lot of the peens are that. So anything that affects 1A2 can affect those medications, right? Uh, 2C19 is important because that's sertraline, acetalopram, all right? Uh, 2B6 is also important because that's wellbutrin and methadone. And uh, 2C9 is difficult, all right? I'm just, I'm just calling out a few. Pharmacodynamics is how the medication works in the body, all right? Is it a D2 antagonist? So it might work, might work for mania, it might work for psychosis. Is it a 5-HT2A antagonist? Right, if something is a D2 antagonist and a 5 c 2 a antagonist, right, and we're talking about medications, you would probably look at atypical antipsychotics, right? That's why they're atypical, because not only do they block D2, but they also are 5 c 2 a antagonists, right? What am I missing there? What else makes something atypical? 5-HT what? 5-HT blank A, 5-HT 1A is also another mechanism of atypical antipsychotics, all right? So if you give someone a 5, but the funny thing is 5-HT 2A, 5-HT 1A, they're actually yin and yang of each other. They do the opposite. Right. I'm going to say it very slowly. A 5-HT1A agonist is the same as a 5-HT2A antagonist. I'm going to say it again. A 5-HT1A agonist is the same of, is a 5-HT2A antagonist. So if a medication is a D2 antagonist and it's also a 5-HT1A agonist, or 5-HT1A partial agonist, you would, you would probably see less EPS, right? Less movement disorder. Because 5-HT1A, when you agonize it, it actually increases dopamine in the nigrostriatal area and increases dopamine in the mesocortical area. All right, I'm going to say it again. A 5-HT1A partial agonist or a full agonist will actually increase dopamine in the frontal lobe and in the nigrostriatal area. All right, we're going to talk about dope, um, we're going to talk about ADHD in the next couple of slides and what part of the brain are we working on? What, what part of the frontal lobe? What's the DLPFC? What does that stand for? Dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. Very good. Dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. All right. Yes. Okay. Do you guys know what medication this is? What do you think this is? Do you think do you think it's Adderall? Concerta. Do you think it's Ritalin? It's very good. It's Concerta. What's important about it? Why am I showing a picture about it? What's important about Concerta? It's um, extended release. It is extended release, that's true, but it has something called Oros technology. What does Oros stand for? Osmotic Osmotic. releasing oral solution. Very good. And what's significant about that? Okay. It has different drug layers that are released, like immediate release and extended release. 
to perfect. Which one do you think is a drug layer one? What do you think is in there? Think it's extended immediate. release. You think it's immediate release. Immediate release. Very good. It's immediate release, right? And what's in drug layer two? Obviously, extended release. All right. So the push layer, which is in the back, is actually water. So what happens is there's a laser drilled hole in where drug layer one is. There's a, there's a laser there that drills a very small hole. And what happens is layer drug one is released first, and that's immediate release. All right. Once the immediate release kicks out, and that's working, right? Because the patient's going to have relief within a half hour, right? It's only going to work for a couple hours because it's immediate release. Extended release starts kicking in after. So in theory, what happened is once immediate release is out of the system, extended release comes in, all right? And then that's when the person gets technically, quote unquote, extended release, all right? Back in the day, Oros technology was, was only available through Concerta, right? Brand name Concerta. They didn't have methylphenidate in the ER back in the day. And the reason why that's important is because since that was proprietary, when it became generic, the patent was still there for oral. So what happened is if you gave someone a generic version of methylphenidate ER and you didn't write oros on it because it wasn't available, patients would not do well, right? And they would wonder, hey, I was taking methylphenidate, I was taking Concerta, how come I'm not, it's not working anymore? And the reason why is because the technology was different. They couldn't do it exact. Some of them use wax and the wax would have to dissolve first. And of course, that's, that's not really as good, right? Because your stomach can dissolve wax differently. So it's not as uh, specific, I'll just say, all right? So... Back then, what you would have to do is when they started developing Oros, a lot of generic companies were able to produce it, right? After that patent went away, you actually had to write the prescription. If you're going to use generic uh, Concerta, you had to write Oros technology because only some generic companies could use that, right? Because it's very expensive. Now, I mean, it's around, I think most generics use Oros technology now, but just be aware that whenever you switch from generic brand to generic, there could be differences, all right? Any questions? Uh, DSM, again, the difference with DSM from DSM-4 to DSM-5 is what? It used to be, in DSM-4, what was it? Age of onset was before age what? Do you know? Seven. Very good, age seven. Why do you think they moved it up to age 12? Because at age seven, sometimes you can't tell, right? Is it ADHD or is it normal child development, right? Kids sometimes can be hyperactive for various reasons, trauma, anxiety. But if you, when they moved it up to age 12, they noticed that they caught a lot more people that were being missed before, all right? This isn't a diagnosing class. You're going to focus more on this next semester, but just to have an understanding of it, okay? Okay, this is very important. There's really only two solutions of ADHD medication. I know there's probably like 25 or maybe 30 formulations now of ADHD medications. Ideally, they're really just branded versions of amphetamine and methylphenidate, right? If you really break down the solution, you have amphetamine solutions, right? And you have methylphenidate solutions, right? Which ones are more potent, amphetamines or methylphenidate? Do you know? Amphetamines. Very good. Why is amphetamines more potent? What does it do? They go in the VMAT in addition to the uh, blocking the dopamine and norepinephrine. Good, and what does that mean? It goes in the VMAT. What, what secretes it more dopamine? It increases the dopamine release. Very good. Which one do you think causes more psychosis and mania, methylphenidate or amphetamines? Amphetamines. Amphetamines cause more, yeah. So in child psychiatry, we tend to use methylphenidates more because we, we kind of appreciate the fact that kids can have their first break at a younger age. For some reason, you know, in general medicine and adult psychiatrists, they use amphetamines more. I mean, these are the stats last time I heard, right? Which is pretty funny. 25% of your patients will respond to methylphenidate, right? 25% will respond to amphetamine. 50% will respond to either one. So it doesn't really matter, all right? But I will say that if there's a family history of psychosis or family history of mania, I probably won't prescribe amphetamines personally, all right? I'll probably use methylphenidate just because I don't wanna, you know, I don't wanna trip them into a, a manic state and I don't want them to become psychotic either. So that tends to be a little bit safer, all right? Any questions with that? So again, amphetamines, they both work in dopamine and norepinephrine transport pumps, all right? Both of them work on that, which is dopamine transport, and net, nor norepinephrine transport. The only difference is that amphetamines actually go inside the cell and they work as a false substrate. And when they, when they attach to the VMAT pump, it reverses it and it causes that receptor to start spitting out more dopamine. Eventually that dopamine is gonna spill out. So in essence, you're actually getting, not only you're keeping the dopamine and norepinephrine there, right? Like you are, because it's a stimulant, you're actually also increasing the release. So that's the difference. Again, amphetamines, not don't just keep neurotransmitters there, they also increase the release, 
Okay, any questions about that? There are isomers, there's D and L isomers of amphetamine. Which one is more potent of dopamine, the D or the L isomer of amphetamine? What do you think, the D or the L? D. Very good, just remember, D stands for dopamine. So that's why we have isomers, dexamphetamine, right? It's a more potent version. It tends to hit dopamine more, and people tend to respond better, all right? Then you're wondering, why don't I just prescribe dexamphetamine to everybody? Why do you want, why do you think we don't just do that then? Abuse. Good, that could be one reason. What's another reason? Why don't I just give everyone dexamphetamine? Number one, it's more expensive, right? Insurance, insurance yeah. doesn't pay. <laughs> Very good. And number two, some people need a little bit of L, all right? So L works more in norepinephrine transport pumps. And if you guys read the style book, L kind of helps more with hyperactivity, right? D works more with focus and attention, right? Because you need dopamine for sustained attention, which is what you guys are doing now, right? You're listening to me and you're sustaining attention. Now, if you heard something outside your window right now and you looked outside your window and you got distracted, that will be issues with, with selective attention, right? Selective attention means you hear a noise outside and you can't go back to the task you were doing before, right? So people with ADHD sometimes have problems with selective and sustained attention, right? Sustained attention, they can't sit in a classroom, listen to a lecture and selective attention, they hear someone talking in the back of the room and they can, all of a sudden they can't listen to the professor. They can't block out the noise from the other person, right? Let's say for instance, you know, living in New York City, you, you hear cars driving by, right? If you had, if you didn't have ADHD, you'd be able to just focus on me talking to you right now, right? But if you had ADHD, every little sound that you hear, it'll be hard for you to tune that up, right? So ADHD is not just a problem with processing; it's also a problem with filtering, right? So sometimes you need a little bit of dopamine, a little bit of norepinephrine together. Okay. Any questions with that? Okay. Also know that there's a um, there's an interaction with one of those when it comes to acidity of your stomach or pH of your stomach? Which one is affected by pH of your stomach? Amphetamines. Very good, amphetamines, right? Because amphetamines are a weak base. So therefore, if the pH of your stomach drops and becomes more acidic, you're actually going to excrete it, excrete it faster, all right? This happened a lot during COVID when I was practicing because a lot of parents were giving their kids vitamin C or emergency, right? They were loading them up. There's like 2,000 milligrams of vitamin C in there. Remember, vitamin C is called ascorbic acid, right? It's an acid. So the parents would come to me and say, hey, I don't know, the meds aren't working anymore or they're not lasting as long. And then when I asked them, are you giving them anything new? And they said, no, no new meds really. Okay, you're giving them any new supplements. Yeah, I don't want them to get sick. I'm giving them vitamin C. All right, so vitamin C will increase the excretion of amphetamines. Therefore, amphetamines will come out, right? Either they're not going to work, either they inactivate them, or they're going to, you know, not last as long. All right, so an extended release might only last like two hours or three hours, Okay. And the opposite as well, right? So if someone gives you an antiacid because you have acid reflux, what do you think is going to happen if you have an amphetamine in your stomach, in your system? You might have insomnia, you might have anxiety, right? You might have more anorexia because you're not going to want to eat. Get get it? Anything that makes your stomach more basic is going to increase amphetamines re uh, release there. It's going to stay there, right? Anything that makes your stomach more acidic is going to make amphetamines leave faster or not work. Okay. So what do you do if that's the case? What what options can you give the patient? Would you increase the dose of amphetamine or no? Would you increase the dose of amphetamine? Would it be wise to increase dose of amphetamine? Or would you do something different? What would you do? Switch it to methamphetamine. You can, very good, yeah. I will give it stratera. Okay, you can do that also. I'm going to talk about that after. Oh. Different classes. Okay, so these are, like I said, these are just different formulations. So you don't have to memorize this chart, but just have a general understanding, all right? If, if Adderall, by the way, is dextroamphetamine amphetamine, all right, the generic name. Make sure you know generics, all right? That's important. We're really, I'm not gonna, I didn't put any brand name in the, in, in the test question. Everything I wrote was generic name for the medication, all right? For stimulants, it's a little bit harder because I said a lot of it's just formulations of Adderall and, and methylphenidate, but... You know, no dextroamphetamine, amphetamine is Adderall, okay? Ritalin is methylphenidate, okay? So you have these short acting. So look, you have D-isomers too. Dexmethylphenidate is a D-isomer of methylphenidate. So it hits dopamine a little bit more, okay? Um, Concerta, know that because that's that's the one I like to use actually because look, duration is 10 to 12 hours. That's what it says, but in practice, you probably only see it for, you know, six to eight hours, 
realistically, okay? Um, which medication for ADHD is a prodrug? Which, which medication, which amphetamine solution is a prodrug? That's a better question, actually, because there's a methylphenidate diversion of it now. Is that Bivens? Very good. What's important about, why is it a prodrug? What's, what, what is a prodrug? Um, it needs to be in the stomach to activate. Okay, but why is it? So prodrug means that a medication needs to be metabolized for it to work, okay? That's important because some medications that are prodrugs the pharmacokinetics is actually very different. I'll give you an example, all right? Let's say you want to give someone uh, tamoxifen, right? Tamoxifen is a prodrug. You use that for breast cancer, right? It has to be metabolized for it to work. So in essence, if you give someone an inhibitor, is the medication going to work more or is it not going to work at all? If it's a prodrug, it has to be metabolized before it works. I'm, I'm emphasizing this. If you give someone an inhibitor, is it going to work or is it not going to work? It's not going to work. It has to be metabolized, right? The reason why I'm emphasizing that, because if a medication is not a prodrug and you give them an inhibitor, normally it's going to increase the dose of the medication so you're going to see more of an effect, right? But if a medication is a prodrug and you give them an inhibitor, it's not going to get metabolized, therefore it's not going to work. Does that make sense to you, right? If you give them an inducer and it's a prodrug, it's actually going to convert it more to the active state and you're going to see more of a response to it. If the medication wasn't a prodrug and you give them an inducer, it's gonna get metabolized, eaten up, and it's not gonna work. Does that make sense? I'm saying that it's very important. A medication that's a prodrug, when you give them an inhibitor, is not gonna work. If a medication is not a prodrug and it's an inhibitor and it doesn't get metabolized, it's gonna increase and it's gonna cause more of an effect. All right. If something is a prodrug and you give them an inducer, right, it's gonna convert most of the drug to the active state and it's going to be more of, a, of an effect, right? If a medication is not a prodrug and you give them an inducer, right, it's going to get metabolized faster and it's not going to work. Think about that for a second. It's the opposite. That's what I'm trying to say. If a med needs to be metabolized for it to work, if you give them an inducer, it's actually going to give more of an effect. If a medication is not a prodrug and you increase it by giving someone an inducer, it's going to get metabolized and it's not going to work. Is that confusing? Or does that make sense? Okay. Can you, can you Oh, who's that? Is that a ghost? No, okay. All right, long acting non-stimulants, okay? So we really have two classes, I'll keep it very general, non-stimulant medications, what are they? You mentioned a few of them. Someone said Stratera, what is Stratera? Norepinephrine inhibitor. Yes, norepinephrine reuptake like, inhibitor. Yeah. NRI, okay. What is another norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor? There's adamoxetine, because I'm only going to use a generic name. Adamoxetine is one. And what is the other one called? Starts with a V. Venaploxine? Veloxazine. Yeah. Veloxazine. All right. What is the difference between adamoxetine and veloxazine? What is the difference? Do you guys know? They're both norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, right? So number one, veloxine is a newer medication, right? It's been out in Europe for a while, but it's probably been out in America for less than a year, right? It's a fairly new medication. The difference between veloxine and adamoxetine is that veloxine tends to be a little bit better tolerated, number one, because it doesn't hit the norepinephrine pumps as strongly as adamoxetine. Sometimes people have side effects from adamoxine because it hits the norepinephrine pump so strongly and so fast that people might have nausea, they might have headaches, they might have dry mouth, they might have constipation, right? Because, you know, fight or flight response, too much norepinephrine. Um, the difference is veloxine doesn't hit it that strongly, so people don't have those same side effects. Also, it tends to be more serotonergic. So it hits the 5-HT27 receptor, and it also hits the 5-HT2C receptor, all right? 5-HT7 downstream will actually increase dopamine norepinephrine, 5-HTC will actually also increase all three neurotransmitters, serotonin, dopamine, and norepinephrine. So technically, in Europe, they actually use veloxine for anxiety. So even though it's not a proof of that, this would be off-label. If someone had anxiety, couldn't tolerate stimulants, right, you gave them Adderall, they started feeling jittery, they didn't like the way it made them feel, I would argue veloxine might be a good medication, all right? Because it hits five the serotonin receptors, and it also will help with 
anxiety, all right? And it also helps norepinephrine, therefore it might help with, you know, focus and hyperactivity, okay? Another important distinction is that veloxetine is a 1A2 inhibitor. Why is that, why is that significant? What are, what are some significant drug-drug interactions if I'm telling you veloxetine is a 1A2 inhibitor? What should you be careful of? Smoking, right? Well, it's not metabolized by 1A2. It's a 1A2 inhibitor. So smoking wouldn't be significant. But what yeah. medications are 1A2 substrates that are significant? Clozapine, right? If someone has schizophrenia, all of a sudden they start, you know, they have comorbid ADHD symptoms and you don't want to actually give them a stimulant, right? Because it's going to might worsen psychosis and you give them veloxazine, you might increase the clozapine levels, right? And cause increased risk of toxicity, constipation, tachycardia, right? Severe neutropenia, which is dangerous, seizures, right? So be careful with that. And caffeine use, all right? So if someone drinks a lot of coffee, same example when I talked about fluvoxamine, Luvac, which is a 1A2 inhibitor also. If someone's a college student and you give them veloxazine, make sure you ask them about their caffeine use because if they're drinking a lot of coffee, they can actually increase their caffeine levels, right? Increase risk of tachycardia, increase anxiety, right? So tell them to cut down their caffeine use, all right? So veloxazine is more serotonergic than atomoxetine. They're both norepinephrine uptake inhibitors, right? But veloxazine is a 1A2 inhibitor, okay? Atomoxetine is still a good medication. I still use it sometimes, but the only problem with it is that sometimes you have to start a BID dosing. And BID, BID dosing could be a problem for some patients because people only want to take meds once a day, right? So that could be a problem, all right? What's another class of non-stimulant medications for ADHD? They're agonists. At what receptor? Uh, guanfacine. Okay, but they're, they're agonists at what receptor? Alpha 2A. Very good. And what's significant about that? What does alpha 2A agonism do? So you have alpha 2A receptors, where are they located? They're located presynaptically, right? And they're autoreceptors. And they're also located postsynaptically, all right? What's the difference between clonidine and guanfacine? You guys know the difference? Clonidine works on alpha 2A, B, and C. Okay, and what's significant about that? Clonidine works on um, 2A, because clonidine can um, have other, like more effects than guanfacine. Yes. So which one can actually cause, you know, more bradycardia and, and drop blood pressure a little bit? Clonidine and guanfacine. Clonidine. Which one is more sedating, clonidine or guanfacine? Clonidine. Clonidine. So if a kid is is having issues falling asleep, they have anxiety at night, right? I would probably give them clonidine, mm -hmm. right? If someone doesn't really have issues falling asleep and isn't as, you know, maybe they're not aggressive, I'd probably use guanfacine, right? The thing about guanfacine is that it, it only works postsynaptically, right? So it tends to be a little bit of a specific cleaner medication. The only problem with guanfacine though, is that it's a 3A4 substrate, so... You know, 3A4 has a lot of interactions, right? They drink grapefruit juice, chamomile tea. That's a 3A4 inhibitor. So what will happen sometimes is, you know, the parents want to help the kids. They give them chamomile tea because it's called sleepy time tea, right, at night. And then they add it and the guanfacine dose gets a little bit higher and the kid gets more dry mouth, more sedation, more uh, dry mouth, more constipation, right? Sometimes they get headaches. So just make sure that you watch that, all right? Also, clonidine needs to be tapered because you can get rebound hypotension. All right, so if someone's in clonidine 0 0.4 mill milligrams, I would probably drop it by 0 0.1 every month and then get them off, all right? Guanvacine, I'll probably taper also, but clonidine is notorious for that, for, for rebound uh, hypertension, okay? Just know if you prescribe immediate release clonidine, immediate release guanfacine, it, it's not FDA approved for um, ADHD. We do it sometimes, I do it sometimes too, but it will be off label. There's some evidence that shows it, but if you wanted to stay with evidence-based practice, I would probably do the... Intuitive, which is guanfacine ER and the cap bay, clonidine ER. All right. Sometimes what I'll do is if a kid has like, you know, needs a medication for like impulsive behaviors, I'll give them IR as a PRN and I'll tell the parents. Or if I'm working inpatient and I want the nurse to be able to give the patient, like when I cover the RTF, which is inpatient unit, I'll, I'll order, you know, PRN medications of immediate release because it won't last that long if they need it just for, you know, impulsive behaviors at that one time. All right. Clonidine immediate release is also has evidence in um, borderline personality disorder. I know we don't have many meds that are FDA approved for borderline, but it has good evidence to help with self-harming behavior. So there are some studies that show that 
patients who take clonidine PRN tend to self-harm less. All right. Any questions with this? All right. Know the short acting, dextroamphetamine, amphetamine, IR, uh, methylphenidate IR will be short acting. All right. Methylphenidate ER or Concerta would be long acting. Uh, Liz dexamphetamine, which is a pro drug, would be considered long acting. All right. Uh, Dextron amphetamine, amphetamine ER would be considered long acting. All right. Pretty self explanatory If it doesn't say ER in front of it, it's immediate release. And I mean, at the end of it, if it doesn't say ER at the end of it, it's immediate release. Okay. This is the same thing again. It's just, if you want, um, this might just break it down a little bit more, but we also use Welbutrin. That's another medication that we use off label sometimes. So if someone has comorbid depression with ADHD-like symptoms, right? And, and you wanted to trial them with a medication, but I give them a stimulant, I would argue Welbutrin might be effective, all right? Welbutrin chemically is an amphetamine solution. So if you if you look at um, the pamphlet, you know, that big pamphlet no one ever looks at when you open up the medication pamphlet, whatever that white paper is, it's uh, it actually resembles a, a um, an amphetamine. The reason why I'm saying that too is because some some kids can they crush the blood butrin and they sniff it and they get the same hit as if they're using amphetamines. So just be careful, kids abuse it. So let's make sure that the parents lock it up and if a kid is requesting blood butrin, just be careful they're not actually sniffing it. All right. Sometimes if a kid can't swallow pills, some some of the medications also come in in um, spheres, microspheres. And you can actually dissolve, you can break them up and you put them inside yogurt or you can put them in ice cream. All right. But they have to eat it like right away. It can't, it can't sit out there. So if the parents want to break it, they have like little spaniels in there. They can, they call them spaniels. Um, real in LA, you can do that with, um, I believe with, I, can't, I don't remember which one of the adult, but one of them too, you can broke. And real in LA for sure, you can, you can open it up, but some of them, anything that's capsule usually with the, with the immediate release, you can break it up. All right. But. You don't need to know that for now. Any questions so far? All right. So this is how I usually prescribe stimulants with kids. All right. Kids can have something called a paradoxical reaction. What is a paradoxical reaction when you give them a medication? What happens? The opposite effect happens than what you're that what you want. Yes, the opposite, right? So sometimes that'll happen with um antihistamines, anticholinergics. Like you give that to kids sometimes and, and they do the opposite, they become more hyper. So what I do to, to alleviate that is they start immediate release first. So what I what I tell parents is that I'm gonna give you you know a weekend supply of Ritalin IR, right? For example, right? That's a methylphenidate solution. What I want you to do is on Saturday morning, I want you to wake the kid up early and I want you to give them Ritalin IR after breakfast, let's say at eight o'clock a.m., all right? I want you to have a book with you and I want you to write down, once you start noticing the medication's working, and I also want you to write down when it peaks. What does that mean, when it, when it peaks? When you notice your kid calmer, focusing, getting tasks done. And I also want you to write down when you start seeing it wearing off, all right? Once you start wearing off, I want you to give them a second dose and I want you to do the same thing and see, all right? So I give them BID dosing, right? After that, I'll have them repeat it. We'll do TID dosing, all right? Once I find the dose, let's say for instance, Ritalin IR three times a day, five milligrams is the spot, right? So five milligrams at 8 a.m., five milligrams at noon, five milligrams at 3.30 or four o'clock PM, right? It wears off by eight o'clock, you can go to sleep. I give them the equivalent of that, all right? Which is around methylphenidate ER, all right? So if you look at the charts, the difference between IR is it goes up and down like a roller coaster, right? You give them the first dose, 8 AM, it goes up. And of course it goes down. They have to get the second dose at 12, it goes up and it goes down, all right? The problem with that is they get something called riddle and rebound. Rebound means that the, besides losing focus, right? They get more agitated. Sometimes they feel depressed. Right. So in order to alleviate that, you give them a methylphenidate ER solution or Concerta because it still goes down, but it's a little bit less. The, the down peaks are not as much. So they don't have that rebound and it lasts them the whole day. All right. Does that make sense? So my strategy for kids is I give them IR first and then bridge them to ER. It might take like two weeks. All right. You can do the same thing with Adderall. Adderall IR five milligrams and you switch them to Adderall ER. Any questions for that? The reason why is because you don't want kids to have a paradoxical reaction. And if they do, it's not an end of the world. You give them media release, it's going to go away in a few hours anyway, right? You don't want to make, make the mistake of giving them ER right away. And then they have a paradoxical reaction and the parents hate you, right? They don't want to come back to you, all right? With adults, I do the opposite strategy. With adults, I give them ER, right? If adults requesting IR, I'm, I'm very skeptical as to why they want the medication, all right? 
So remember, for the kids, you want to do scales. We use the Vanderbilt scale. You guys know anyone here have kids with ADHD or no kids with ADHD? You have to do the scales. It has to be in, in two settings, all right? In the school and at home, right? The mom fills one out and, and the teachers spell one out. Pop quiz. Does a kid need a neuropsych exam to start stimulants? Is it mandatory? Yes or no? Mm, yes. No, it's not mandatory. Yes. The only time you would order a neuropsych exam is if you thought that there was a learning disorder or something else that could be confounding it, right? But it's not recommended because number one, it it it, it uh, increases disparity of care because what if people can't afford a neuropsych exam, right? Or finding a psychologist that does it, there's a three-month waiting list, right? You're not going to let the patient wait for three months to get that. So it's going to be clinical interviewing, right? And you're uh, Vanderbilt, right? So Vanderbilt scores highly that they have inattention, hyperactivity in school, Scores highly at home that they have been attention and you know, uh, hyperactivity at home. Your clinical interview, right? There's a family history. I would just start them on the medication. All right. Do you need to do an EKG before you start a stimulant? Yes or no? Yes. According, no, you don't. No. Nope. 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 You don't. According to the American Academy of Pediatrics, you do not need it. Right. Of oh. course, if there's a family history of cardiac problems, if they have history of syncope, they have history of chest pain or shortness of breath, I would do it. But there is no, you do not need to have an EKG on file to do, to stop people on stimulants. You do not. Okay. I don't, you don't do that. Sorry, you said with adults, you start on IR, right? No, immediate release. Immediate release. With kids, I start with IR. With kids, IR. With adults, no, ER. Oh, but okay. The EKG can be ordered for adults or not? Or oh, it's not mandatory for it, the adults? Same, 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 same concept. If there's no, if there's no history, if there's nothing that, you know, I would say if it's an older adult, I would do it, right? If it's a geriatric patient, even though, mm -hmm. you know, geriatric ADHD is, is kind of controversial, I would still do mm -hmm. it, right? But if I'd say like, you know, a 25 year old, you know, there's no history. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. But definitely for kids, you don't have to, if there's no, you know, if there's no symptoms, there's nothing that would indicate it, right? If you have, look, if you if you work closely with a pediatrician and you can get an EKG done quickly, why not, right? But if it's outpatient and it's and you have to like coordinate and the, the kid is tearing up the house and doing bad in school to wait two weeks or three weeks for an EKG, you know, I don't think it's fair. But if you can get one done quickly, it wouldn't hurt, but it's not recommended, all right? It's not, it's not required, I'm saying. It's not required, okay? Side effects of treatment, all right? Stimulants, anorexia, insomnia, obviously, right? It's going to be hard for them to sleep. Stunted growth, because it suppresses growth hormone, all right? Anxiety, psychosis, mania, self-explanatory, all right? Non-stimulant, GI side effects, all right? Headache and fatigue, those are the most common side effects, all right? There's other ones, but these are the most common ones you're going to see. All right. People, um, you know, back in the day, they used to think that if you give someone stimulants, that they would be much shorter than everyone else. But there's studies that are disproving that now, which means that it it, it just means that they, they might have a delayed growth spurt. So they might be shorter than other kids, but then later on, they might catch up. Again, that's controversial. There's studies that show both ways. What I usually do is I present both to the parents. All right. And I say, look, you know, these are the, these are some of the side effects. These are some of the risks. You know, do you want to treat it with stimulants? Some parents will say, no, I want my kids, you know, my kids are short. You know, me and my husband are both short. I don't want the kids to be shorter. Let's not put them on stimulants. And I respect that, you know, but they have to know that the effect size of non-stimulants are not going to be as strong. All right. So there might be some improvement, but really there's a the reason why the gold standard for ADHD is stimulants because they work quickly and you see effect right away. All right. There are some practitioners out there that don't want to prescribe stimulants because they're afraid of, you know, Cardiac problems, long-term histories of abuse. That's kind of been disproven a little bit. But again, you know, there's very few, you know, symptoms in psychiatry that we can prove very quickly, right? We can give someone a medication and you see an improvement right away. Number one is stimulants, right? And what's number two? We talked about in schizophrenia. It's benzos for what? Catatonia, right? If someone's catatonic and you give them Ativan, two milligrams IM, within like 15 minutes, they're talking, they're walking, right? And then once it wears off, they go back to bed, right? And they're stuck like a statue, right? You see, it, you see it right away. You don't see that with psychosis. You don't see that with mania. You don't see that with depression, right? It takes time for it to work. 
But you give someone a stimulant, they have ADHD, they're going to be calmer, right? It's, it's the opposite. They're going to be focused, right? Less impulsive. And non-stimulants take about two to four weeks to work. So it takes time. If you look at the studies, really, you know, the best treatments, believe it or not, and I present this to parents too, are actually using both, right? Not, not just having Adderall on board, but having both. So if when they do studies, actually alpha-2 agonists combined with stimulants, the patients actually do a lot better. And I'll tell you why, because the side effects of one complement the other, all right? So I usually like to use this analogy with, with parents, right? It's like peanut butter and jelly. They're both good separately, but when you put them both together, it's like magic. They just taste so much better, right? You can give your kids Adderall, right? But then they're going to know it's going to work, but then it might, it might worsen their insomnia at night, right? But then you're happy because during the daytime, they're focused. Right. And they're not tearing up the house anymore when they come home from school. But the problem is insomnia. So what do I do? I say, well, we can add clonidine at night because it's a synergistic effect. Now I'll, I'll show you the, the beauty about this strategy. Let's say for instance, at, um, methylphenidate 18, right. Is working, but it's not working enough. Right. So I put them on 27. It's working better, but methylphenidate ER 27. Now it's working better in daytime, but then now they're having trouble sleeping at night. Right. What I tell the mom is look, let's try this. Let's put them on clonidine at night for a couple of weeks, right? Let it kick in, okay? Help them sleep better. And since there's a synergistic effect, remember synergy means that two meds together are, work, are, are actually better than one medication by itself, right? So it's synergistic. So it's going to give you more, more value with the methylphenidate. Therefore, I, I probably can go down to methylphenidate 18 and keep the, the clonidine on board, right? So yeah, this is the example. Going from methylphenidate ER27, it works, but they're having insomnia, right? Methylphenidate ER18 is not enough. I add clonidine at night that helps with sleep. Synergistically, it helps with the 18. Once the clonidine starts working at night, I bring them back down to 18. And guess what? The 18 works better than the 27 because it's synergistic. The norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor together with the net and the DAT of the methylphenidate are actually helping with the symptom. Does that make sense? You could do the same thing with enamoxetine and veloxetine. But if someone's having insomnia, an alpha-2 agonist is probably better, all right? Does that make sense? This is just a picture of what we talked about before. Remember, guanfacine is selective. It's 3A4 only. It only works postsynaptically, the 5 c 2 a receptor, right? Clonidine works presynaptically and postsynaptically. The imadazoline, uh, I always say that wrong. It has anti-pain properties too. So sometimes you'll see clonidine helps with pain as well, neuropathic pain. So you'll see neurologists use that sometimes. The clonidine will help with pain. And the A, B, and C obviously work in the peripheries. All right, DSM criteria. Uh, once again, this is for, oh, we're talking about neurodevelopmental. We don't really treat autism that much, but just have a general understanding of what autism is. If you see a patient that has some traits, right? A patient comes to you, they have stereotypical behavior. They might be stimming, right? Odd behaviors of the hands, you know, um, poor eye contact. Um, family tells you when they were, when, you know, ever since they were a kid, they really didn't have much affection. They didn't really care for social interactions. I would probably recommend them to have a screening for autism, all right? They might also have some very fixed, you know, um, fixed things. Like they might love, you know, cars, they might love trains, and they want things organized a certain way, almost like OCD-like, right, perfectionism. So that combined with, you know, stereotypical behaviors, um, you know, poor eye contact, lack of socialization skills, I would have them screen for autism, all right? Uh, these are just some things that, that, that uh, we wanted you guys to know, but Diagnosis of ADHD clinical features. Uh, obviously, there's just two types, right? Inattention, hyperactivity, or combined. There's actually three, all right? Well, a lot of times, most people will be combined, but, you know, why is it that females tend to get diagnosed less early in life and males do? Why do you think that is? Why do boys tend to get the diagnosis earlier? Because boys tend to be a little more hyperactive and they'll see that more, right? So they'll catch that. A female might not be diagnosed because she might have more inattention type and she sits in the back of the room and keeping to herself when her grades are poor, right? Just be aware of that, right? Identify diagnostic clinical features of autism spectrum, like I said, repetitive behaviors, you know, um, poor eye contact, poor social skills, 
you know, infatuations with specific things, well, dinosaurs, cars, whatever, specific things. Discuss the different subtypes of ADHD. Discuss the mechanisms of action of stimulants, difference between amphetamines and difference between methylphenidate solutions. Identify appropriate treatments, all right, for ADHD. Like I said, um, we really want to use stimulants if we can because, you know, they're, they have a lot of evidence behind them and they work very strong and quickly too, all right? The irony behind people who treat ADHD a lot of times is that we actually tend to underdose kids. Do you know that? Why do you think that we the practitioners tend to underdose kids for ADHD? Why do we underdose them? Maybe they don't want them to abuse it. That could be one, yeah. Anything else? Okay. A lot of times, you know, of course, that's one thing as a practitioner, you know, you, you don't want kids to develop a you know a habit of taking medications. But the problem is you don't know what the kid's full potential is going to be unless you maximize the dose. All right. So one of my mentors was actually an ADHD specialist, and this is how he trained me. So this is how I'm going to train you guys. All right. You push up the AD, as long as there's no psychosis or mania, you push up the ADHD meds until the patient can't tolerate it. What does that mean? You push it up until they're not sleeping or they stop eating. All right. The reason why I say that is because a lot of times, a lot of people who are not specialists will be so afraid to push it up that you're kind of giving people subpar treatment. Well, he's doing better than he was before. So therefore, you know, methylphenidate ER18 is good enough, right? He's not having side effects and he's doing better than he was in school. Yet yeah, he still has an attention or she has an attention and, you know, is not performing to their full ability. So what you want to do is you really want to maximize it so they get the most of their dosing and then you can push back. All right, oh, 27 was too much. Let's go back to 18, all right? 36 was too much, let's go back to 27. Oh, 54 was too much, we can always go back to before, all right? This also makes you see the patient more often. So I don't prescribe, 80, in the first one, I'm first doing meds, I, I only give people five-day supplies, all right? Because you'll know it right away, it works pretty quickly. So if I only give you five-day supply, of, so this is the mistake people do, right? I'm gonna give you methylphenidate ER18, I'm gonna give you a month supply, I'll see you in a month. If there's any problems, call me, I'll, I'll squeeze you in sooner, all right? The patient comes back in a month. You know what? I am doing better than 18. Let's just stay on the 18, all right? The practitioner's like, oh, man, I don't want to go. I didn't want to go to 27 anyway. I didn't want to give them side effects. Oh, perfect. They'll stay in 18. It's a low dose. But you, you're not really giving them the best treatment because they're still having inattention, right? But they're afraid to tell you because you're telling them it's okay to stay in 18 and they're not really performing to the best of their ability. Does that make sense? And it's fading. They're not able to do work after school because they know their meds wear off at four o'clock. So they're going to try to get all their work done, but they can't do anything extra after school. All right. But just think about that. All right. Not that you're going to be too liberal with those and give everyone 54 or you're going to go up to Adderall 40 with everybody XR. Right. But try to push it up and explain the rationale for it. Right. I don't want, I want you to perform to the best of your ability. All right. If you have ADHD, by the way, it's, this is not for, for performance enhancement. All right. So I do have a lot of people that work in finance who say, hey, I have an exam for finance. Can you please give me an Adderall? I need it. No, that's not what it's for. All right, just be careful. People will try to, to get over on that. All right. There's actually a, a company that was uh, that opened up Blossom during COVID. What was it called? They were specializing in ADHD. You heard about them? And they, they were actually, embarrassingly enough, they were hiring a lot of NPs. And what happened was they were diagnosing people with ADHD and and they're also one of the reasons why there's a shortage of, of ADHD medication because they were, they were like a pill mill. They were prescribing ADHD meds to anyone who asked for it. They did scales before the assessment and literally they did like a 20 minute assessment, 25 minute assessment and they, they prescribed the meds. It was, sent, it was sent to the patient's home and everyone was getting ADHD medications. I can't think of the name of it, but it's still being investigated right now by the, by the FDA, I believe. And a lot of those people might lose their license. Right? It's not worth it. So don't do it. Right. Make sure you rule out other things first. So ADHD should probably be the last in your differential. So if someone has inattention and they're having issues sleeping, I would rule out bipolar disorder. Right. The reason why I'm saying that is because last thing you want to do is give someone a stimulant if you think it's ADHD, but it's actually bipolar disorder. Right. You're going to make them manic. So you want to work in that. Make sure they're not abusing medication. Well, make sure they're not abusing marijuana first. Right. Someone has inattention, but they're smoking weed every day. Maybe, you know, doing some harm reduction, trying to get them off the marijuana. Right, because that's gonna worsen their cognition also. All right. Um, if they have a history of mood disorder, I would probably make sure that's treated first. If they have a history of psychosis, make sure that's treated first. And you actually can give someone a stimulant if they're taking antipsychotic medications, right? I do it sometimes, but it's more advanced technique. 
if you have patients on long acting injectable, let's say someone has schizophrenia, right? And they still have, you know, they have a history of ADHD and the ADHD is still there, it's affecting them and they're on a long acting injectable. I would give them a low dose of ADHD medications as long as they're getting their injectable every month, right? If you're taking pills, I might be more hesitant, right? Because God forbid they forget their, their olanzapine or the clozapine and they take the Adderall for two days straight, right? They're going to become psychotic and they might end up back in the hospital. So either their partner is giving it to them or the family members are making sure that they, they take the antacids. Because remember, that's like a, think of it like a, a what do you call that? A, a roof, right? It's, it's going to stop anything else from going up. It's like, a, it's, it's a safe, uh, they're not going to increase dopamine to the point where they become psychotic. Because the at least the D2 antagonist is going to be there, right? Or the partial agonist. You don't want it to be naked and you're giving them dopamine agonist. And it's going to innervate the mesolimbic area so much that it's going to cause psychosis, all right? Quick review. Mesocortical area, negative symptoms of schizophrenia, all right? Mesolimbic is positive symptoms of psychosis, all right? Nigrostriatal has to do with movement disorders, okay? Tuberoinfundibular, that has to do with prolactin elevations, all right? If you guys didn't remember already. All right. Any questions? We can talk about anxiety. We can talk about schizophrenia. We can review ADHD. These are going to be on your exam next week on the 22nd. It's going to be open for two days. All right. It's going to be open on Wednesday. Uh, the day that was before and the day after. I think Thursday and Friday. 48 hours. Can we go over clozapine a little since that's going to be a heavier topic? Yes. So clozapine is considered... Uh, the first atypical antipsychotic that was developed, right? So it's a very strong 5 ac 2 antagonist. And the funny thing about clozapine is actually not a very strong D2 antagonist, all right? Unlike other D2 antagonists who need to block about 60 to 80% of your dopamine receptors in the mesolimbic area, clozapine only blocks 20 to 40%. But for some reason, it works in antipsychotic medication, all right? There's many different hypotheses. You know, people believe it's a TAR1 agonist, which, start, which stands for trace amine-associated receptor agonist and a cholinergic agonist, all right? Um, there is an interneuron next to the BTA, which is an acetylcholine neuron, which innervates M1, M4. And if you hit that receptor, it actually disinhibits, it inhibits, I'm sorry, the BTA. So instead of blocking the nucleus accumbens, right, or the ventral striatum to get your antipsychotic effect, right, at the postsynaptic neuron, what you're doing is you're actually innervating that that interneuron, that's acetylcholine, to hit the BTA and it tells it to release less dopamine. So in theory, that could be one of the reasons why you only need 20, 40% of clozapine to block, right? Think about it. If the BTA is hyperactive and it's spitting freely dopamine, it's gonna hit that mesolimbic area, right? The, the, the uh, ventral striatum, you might have to block 80% because it's hyperactive, right? But if you're working presynaptically in the interneuron, in the acetylcholine receptor, is already telling the BTA, hey, shut down dopamine release. It may not release that much dopamine, therefore you might get away with 20 to 40% of dopamine blockade. Does that make sense? All right. Clozapine is also a very strong antihistamine, anticholinergic, therefore it causes a lot of weight gain and a lot of sedation. So that's a complaint a lot of patients have. So therefore I recommend dosing clozapine at bedtime if a patient can tolerate it, all right? Because the thing is, if, if they're sedated, they're going to bed anyway. Right? You don't want the medication peaking in the morning and then they're a college student and they're and they're dragging and they can't make to make it to their first couple classes because they're on clozapine. All right. Drooling is also a side effect of clozapine. So remember, clozapine, the funny thing about clozapine, it's it has an active metabolite. All right. When you do a clozapine level, you get clozapine itself, right? And you also get a level for norclozapine, which is the active metabolite. All right. There's a ratio usually for that. I don't remember off the top of my head, but there's a ratio for that. If that ratio changes right? Then of course, you're going to have more side effect of the other. So I'll give you an example. If the ratio of, of clozapine is higher than the norclozapine ratio, right? Will someone have more anticholinergic side effects or more cholinergic side effects? What do you think? More anticholinergic, right? Because clozapine is anticholinergic. The active metabolite norclozapine is actually cholinergic. It's a cholinergic agonist. So when you give someone clozapine, you're actually giving them two medications in essence. The clozapine by itself is going to work, and then whatever is metabolized in norclozapine is going to work also. Why do you think when you give someone clozapine, which I'm saying is one of the strongest anticholinergic medications out there, why are patients drooling? Right? How can you give someone anticholinergic and they're drooling? Isn't that cholinergic side effects? Right? Drooling. Because they have norclozapine in there also, right? The, nor the norclozapine is causing them to drool, right? 
But that drooling is also telling me that in the central nervous system, they're getting cholinergic agonism, which might actually help with their schizophrenia, right? Get it? So you need a little bit of both. So that ratio might be off. Okay, so clozapine, you have to make sure you check white blood cell count. All right, in the very beginning, the first six months, you have to do a absolute neutrophil count. All right, neutrophil count should be above what level? Do you guys know? 1.5. Very good, 1.5, all right? Or sometimes 1.5 times 10 to the third, or sometimes it could be uh, 1,500. Some labs are different, but you know, 1.5 times 10 to the third is the same as 1,500, all right? Once it drops below 1,500, all right? You, I would probably repeat it if the patient doesn't have symptoms, all right? Except if the patient has a genetic disorder called what? Which affects people of um, African and Mid Middle Eastern descent, usually. I'll give you a hint. Uncle Ben from Spider-Man. Who's Uncle Ben from Spider-Man? Ben, benign ethnic neutropenia, all right? Benign atrophic neutropenia is a congenital disease that people are born with that for some reason in those parts of the world, they're able to function with very low neutrophil count, right? But that has to be shown over time. So usually what'll happen is if you have a history of their labs, you can say, hey, your neutrophil count is low. Let's look at your other labs, right? If your PCP wants to look at it and they'll say, hey, look, this guy's, every time you've done your CBC, the neutrophil count has been like a thousand, you know, and they're fine. I would probably still send them to a hematologist and get it confirmed. They can do genetic testing to confirm it that they have been and have it on record. So, you know, just in case they don't have been, you know, the liability is not on you. All right. So make sure you work with a specialist on that. So usually I do, I've had a few patients that had been that I've worked with in the past and they had a hematologist confirm that through genetic testing. All right. So it was documented. If someone has been, they can actually stay on clozapine as long as the neutrophil count is above a thousand. Once it goes up below a thousand, you have to stop the clozapine. All right. Any questions for that? So the first six months, every week, they have to do blood work. It is a pain and a lot of patients don't like it. But like I said, it's the only medication that might give them full relief of their, of their symptoms. All right. So if someone takes an antipsychotic, right, and they fail on it, the second antipsychotic, they have like a 7% chance of responding to a second antipsychotic. All right. It's different, but this is just an average. The third antipsychotic, if you don't give them clozapine, it's less than 5%. All right, so let's say you failed in Abilify, I put you on Risperidol, all right? And I know you were taking those medications. If I was to try doing a third antipsychotic, your chance of responding to a third is actually less than 5%. If I use clozapine as a third trial, you have 50 to 60% chance of responding to it. So you have to tell the patients that, right? I know it's a scary medication. I know that there's a lot of side effects, but if you want relief of your schizophrenia, it's the only medic medication I can offer you that's evidence-based for treatment resistant schizophrenia, all right? It's really up to them. If, if they don't want to take it, you document it. The next, probably the next best thing that's a little bit more than 5% is high dose olanzapine. Like olanzapine 30 milligrams. I do that sometimes too. But of course, I want to give patients the best treatment. So, you know, specializing in schizophrenia, I have a lot of clozapine patients, right? And I have to sell it to them because if they don't want to take clozapine, there's really nothing more I can offer them, you know? And I don't want to put them through different antipsychotics. They go on Latuda, they go on Vralar, they go on Complita, all these newer medications, right? And then they're failing on it and, and you're, they're suffering, right? And they're gaining weight and they still have hallucinations. You know, I mean, as best as I can, I try to, you know, negotiate with them and say, look, I have a lot of experience with starting clozapine. I'll make sure that we make sure that you don't have any bad side effects. The most common side effects actually is, is constipation. Why is constipation really bad? Anticholinergic effect. Oh, but why is it bad? What happens if- Paralytic ileus. Yeah, ileus, right? And all that toxins are going to build up, right? Literally, a patient is full of shit, right? Literally. So you have to make sure that you ask them. What do you think normal bowel transit time is? Like, how long does your stool go in? I mean, not your stool, but when you eat, it goes in your stomach. I said, Justin, how, how long does it take for it to come out the other side? On average. 24 to 48 hours, all right? On average. That's why people have daily bowel movements, right? Or every two days, at least. You put someone on clozapine, it goes to almost five days, over a hundred hours. So imagine all that stool that's gonna sit in there if, if you don't move their bowel. So usually, I, once you put someone on clozapine, automatic, you're on colex. You have to be on colex, BID or TID, all right? That's a stool softener. Colex doesn't work, I get the Miralax. What's Miralax, how does that work? The laxative. Very good, osmotic laxative, right? So you have to drink a lot of water, the water's gonna push it out, okay? Miralax doesn't work. Why do I add Axel? What's next? What's Senna? An irritant laxative, right? 
So that's the algorithm. But you don't stop it. Like if I'm going to go to Miralax, I don't stop Colace. I have to add them on top. So they stay on Colace automatic, right? I keep the Colace on and how about I add Miralax on top of that. All right, Miralax doesn't work. I add Senna on top of that. I have some patients on three. All right. The other option would be linaclotide, which works on prostaglandins. You can do that. That would be like the four. But I would leave that to a primary care doctor to do that or a specialist to do that. It's very rare that you have to go that. Most of the time, if you put people on the trifecta of the of the stool softener, osmotic laxative, and the irritant oxidative, and you stop other anticholinergic medication, usually they move their bowels. They do. Make sure you check they're not, let's say they're on, you know, cogentin still. I don't know why, but they're on cogentin. Or there are other medications that are anticholinergic, let's say tricyclics or something, right? Prescribed by someone else. I would probably get them off those medications, right? Because clozapine by itself is the most important, all right? So number one, make sure they're having a bowel movement. Number two, you're checking absolute neutrophil count, all right? Every week for the first six months. After six months, it's every two weeks, okay? After one year, it's it's once a month. Okay, in Europe, they don't even do it. They don't even do that anymore. I think after one year, you just get your regular annual exam. There's actually a push for that. A lot of psychiatrists and MPs wrote a letter and we're trying actually to get that overturned. That after one year, you shouldn't have monthly blood work anymore. Why do you think that is? improve compliance it is number one and number two how does how do you think clozapine works why how does it cause um neutrophilia it's it would be in, it would be initially response. right if yes. it didn't happen it, it would happen initially right and then down the line very good so the first three months is when they're at highest risk so after that it gets less than it gets an autoimmune response something in clozapine tells your body to attack itself, right? But usually over time, they get less, if it's autoimmune, it gets less and less, right? As opposed to Depakote, which is a histone deacetylase inhibitor, which actually can happen anytime. All right, so be careful with that. That's why with, with Depakote, I tend to do CBC a lot more often, every month if I have to, just to make sure. All right, clozapine, autoimmune, similar to Lamotrigine with Steven Johnson, autoimmune. That's why after you know your first couple of months on it, the risk is never zero, but it gets less and less. They stay on the medication. All right. Does that make sense? Clozapine, very strong anticholinergic. What happens if you, let's say someone's stable on 300 milligrams of clozapine. All of a sudden they start having chest pain and you order uh, cardiac enzymes and you order echocardiogram and you go, oh my God, they have uh, myocarditis and you stop it. Do you stop clozapine right away cold turkey or no? What do you think the answer is to that? You do stop clozapine, but you don't do a cold turkey. You have to give them anticholinergic medication on top of that. All right. So the equivalent is about um, one milligram of cogentin for every 100 milligrams of clozapine and 50 milligrams of benztropine for every 100 milligrams of clozapine. You do the math, right? There's someone stable on, I don't know, 300 milligrams of uh, clozapine, right? That would be, you would do the math, right? I'm sorry, two milligrams of cogentin. That's how anticholinergic clozapine is. If someone's a non smoker, it's actually two milligrams of cogentin for the 100 milligrams of clozapine, all right? The reason why if we stop it cold turkey, they're gonna have agitation and they're gonna really, really be bad and they might be hospitalized for it. They might be delirious, they're gonna be confused, not gonna know. So just know you can't stop clozapine cold turkey. You have to taper it. You have to give them something anticholinergic, whether it's Benadryl or cogentin and taper them off slowly to, to get those receptors to go back. Is that a co-administration with both together or just- No, no, no. I'm sorry. And then go down to- One or the other. It's up to you. You either use Benadryl or you use cogentin. It's up to you. You don't have to use both. So no, you... I mean, like, are you taking are you taking the um, clozapine with the cogentin and tapering? No, no. Stopping You're stopping the clozapine, the clozapine right away. Stop and it. then tapering down with a- um... Yes. Let's say whatever dose of clozapine they're on, you stop it right away and you give them that same dose the same night of whatever anticholinergic med you want to use, the equivalent dose of cogentin, or Benadryl, all right? You don't have to memorize the dosing, it's okay. Just know that concept. You have to give them anticholinergic medication. That's equivalent dose of clozapine that's Benadryl or the equivalent dose that's cogentin and wean them off of it. It might take a month or two, all right? You can't just stop an anticholinergic medication cold turkey, all right? Or else they're gonna have rebounds and they're gonna be agitated, right? And what's the opposite of anticholinergic? They'll also have diarrhea. <laughs> Right, the opposite of dry mouth, drooling, right? Their body's gonna go back to the opposite of what it was before, right? It's so gonna be very uncomfortable to say the least. So don't stop close it being cold turkey without putting in anticholinergic med, taper them off, all right? Anything that's anti-close, uh, olanzapine as well, right? Olanzapine, you don't wanna just stop cold turkey also. 
you want to make sure you tape. Let's say you're switching someone from olanzapine to, I don't know, risperidone. You have to taper them off olanzapine over a month, slowly, while you're adding the risperidone. So there's a cross taper. So let's say, for instance, someone's on 20 milligrams of olanzapine, right? I want to switch them to risperidone because they gain so much weight on the olanzapine. I might lower the olanzapine to 15 milligrams for a week, right? And start them on one milligram of risperidone. The second week, I'm going to go to 10 milligrams of, of, of olanzapine and two milligrams of risperidone, right? Then five milligrams of olanzapine and three milligrams of risperidone, right? Then 2.5 have to or five and go down and you have to cross taper it. All right, because risperidone doesn't really have very much anticholinergic, antihistamine. You're losing that. So whenever you're giving someone a medication that doesn't have the same receptor profile of that first medication, you have to make sure, number one, is it acetylcholine? Because that has a lot of rebound, all right? Is it antihistamine? Because that has rebound too. You have to you have to be able to taper them off it or give them a med to, you know. That's why sometimes in the hospital, I'll give them... Um, if I'm giving them risperidone and that I want to, and they want to stop closing, let's say they want to stop olanzapine right away. I don't want to take it. I don't want to do a cross taper. I'll give them a benzo to, to, to help them alleviate the anticholinergic withdrawal. All right, we'll see that sometimes too. Because they're going to be agitated and you want them to be calm and patient. All right. Any questions? Any other? Clozapine is metabolized by 1A2, by the way. It is metabolized by 3A4, 2D6 a little bit, but majority of it is 1A2. So, Smoking cigarettes, remember, smoking cigarettes, right? Not chewing nicotine. Smoking cigarettes or smoking marijuana is a 1A2 inducer. That's going to drop your clozapine level, all right? Caffeine, which is a 1A2 inhibitor, is going to increase your clozapine level, all right? Be careful with patients who are, you know, going home and then, you know, because say they're in a hospital is stable on clozapine and, and they're drinking decaf coffee in the hospital and then they go back to drinking regular coffee at home, their clozapine level is going to go up. So make sure that you educate them and say, look, be careful because, you know, your clozapine level can go up. You might, you might have to send them back in a week later to do another clozapine level again after they're back to their normal habitat. You might have to adjust the clozapine, right? Let's say they're stable on 200, 200 milligrams of clozapine. They say, you know, I, I can't I can't not drink coffee every morning. I drink like two or three cups. All right, let's do a clozapine level and I'm going to reduce your clozapine to match what it is, all right? But what do you do if they stop... They say, you know, I want to cut down the coffee. I don't want to drink it anymore. Then you have to increase the clozapine again, right? You have to have that conversation with your patient. If you're going to stop smoking or you're going to increase caffeine intake or drop caffeine intake, you have to do clozapine levels. I'm going to have to adjust it accordingly. All right, because if not, it's going to be off. It's going to be very wonky and the patient's going to have symptoms again, all right? Smoking, 1A2 inducer. Caffeine, 1A2 inhibitor, all right? What about if I say, hey, um, you know, you have inattention, we do a, we do a history. You find out you have ADHD, and I give them veloxetine. What's going to happen to the clozapine level? Is it going to go up or is it going to go down? It's a one A two inhibitor. It's going to go up, right? Clozapine is going to go up. You give someone a one A two inhibitor, clozapine is going to go up. There's a there's a bunch of one there's a bunch of meds interact. So ciprofloxacin is a one A two inhibitor. So if your patient is going to the primary care doctor and they have a UTI, tell the primary care doctor, do not prescribe them <laughs> ciprofloxacin, all right? Because it can potentially kill the patient. It actually can, it can 10 times clozapine level, 10 times. So imagine the clozapine level is like 600. It's going to be 6,000, all right? So be careful. Make sure you tell them that. No ciprofloxacin, all right? Antifungal medications, ketoconazole, 182 inhibitor. Do not give them oral ketoconazole, all right? And if they give them the cream, the cream over time also can can also you know go into the blood. It can increase it also. So be careful with that also. All right. If they have OCD, stay away from fluvoxamine. All right, because fluvoxamine is a one A two inhibitor. It'll increase it too. Unless you know it's intentional, you want to increase clozapine and fluvoxamine helps with them. But you have to again, that has to be you know you have to know what you're doing and make sure you check levels. But just be careful with those. Right. Veloxazine, be careful with clozapine. Ciprofloxacin, be careful with clozapine. Ketoconazole, be careful with clozapine. All right, and there's another one that we talked about. I can't think of it right now. They say veloxazine, veloxazine, ketoconazole, ciprofloxacin. I think those are the main ones. Any questions? I just wanted to confirm um, OCD will not be on the exam. 
No. Yeah. Unless you want me to put it on there. Interesting fact about clozapine. It's a very strong 5-HC2 A antagonist. It actually causes secondary OCD to it. Just think about it. OCD is serotonergic. You're giving someone a very strong 5-HC2 A antagonist. So I've actually seen that a lot too. So be careful with clozapine and OCD developing. That's why usually what I'll do is I'll give them something called a Y-box scale. Y-box stands for Yale Brown Obsessive Compulsive Scale. And I want to make sure they don't have OCD before I start the clozapine. Because if they don't have it and they start the clozapine, all of a sudden they have OCD. I pretty much know the clozapine is causing it, right? Of course, the clozapine is the only option for them. If they have treatment resistant schizophrenia, I have no choice but to keep them on the clozapine. But then the problem is you have to put them on a very high dose of a SSRI to, to kind of compensate for it. And sometimes you, you can't find that balance because I might have to put them on like 400 milligrams of surgery and then they have sexual dysfunction, right? To overcome the 5 g 2 a antagonism of the clozapine. So unfortunately, it's, you have to like play around with it and work with the patient, explain to them what's happening. It's a very difficult, you know, thing to treat. In the stall book, um, it said about tonic firing and phasic firing, and I didn't really, I guess, grasp it. So um, tonic firing is just normal firing that's happening from your, remember your ARAFs I talked about, your sending reticular activating system we spoke about last time. You need that for innervation in your cortex. Tonic firing is happening right now or else you'd be dead, <laughs> Right. You need tonic firing of your neurons, which is tonic, to constantly keep firing. Phasic is what reinforces learning and reinforces memory. So whenever, you know, I say a joke, you guys laugh, or I say something that scares you, that will be phasic firing. So your dopamine will actually phasically fire, and that will cause something called EPSP. So you've seen that in the book, excitatory postsynaptic potential. Over time, EPSPs will build up, and that will cause memory storage. Right? I don't want to confuse you, but just know that phasic firing is implicated in memory and learning, Tonic firing is just day-to-day -day stuff in order for you to function and like move around, all right? Too much phasic firing can lead to abuse. So for instance, that's why when people are doing cocaine or any kind of stimulant, you're doing too much phasic firing, it's reinforcing it, you're hitting the nucleus accumbens too strongly, right? That they become, you know, addicted because they like that euphoric effect, all right? Professor? Yes. I have a question about uh, GABA B. Okay. and GHB receptors. Okay, what about it? Can you explain to me? Uh, one of the questions it says, differentiate between partial GABA agonists, 5 ht 21 a agonists, busperidone, GABA B, and GHB receptors. I didn't understand the stall book about GABA B and GHB. So can you explain to me, please? Okay, so GABA is implicated in anxiety. And there's different mm -hmm. types of GABA also. So there's a new form of GABA medications that are being used now. The extrasynaptic extra GABA medications, kind of like the allopregnanolone medications that we use for postpartum depression. And there's another one that they're trying to release for regular depression. Just know that GABA, you need that for right now, just for your general knowledge, right? Because you guys are still in the first semester. Just know that GABA will help with anxiety for now. All right, mm -hmm. so all the GABA questions I'm asking you is going to be bent. By the way, benzodiazepine, you should probably know which ones are short-acting, intermediate, and long, right? General. No, Xanax is shorter. Xanax tends to hit a little bit faster. It's more lipophilic, right? So that means it crosses mm -hmm. blood-brain barrier faster. Therefore, it has a higher potential of abuse, all right? The funny thing about GABA is that, about Xanax, I'm sorry, is that there's actually some good data to show that GABA, them GABA, Xanax also has very good antidepressant properties. So back in the day, GABA was actually given for depression. GABA, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, it's getting too late. Xanax. Xanax was being given for <laughs> depression, all right? So you might see that sometimes, you know, people will be on Xanax with an SSRI, and when you try to get them off the Xanax, their depression actually comes back, all right? I would argue that if they're not running out of prescriptions, you know, too early, and there's no history of alcohol abuse, I would probably would keep them on, on the Xanax, all right? But again, I'll leave that to your, your clinical decision-making skills when you guys start practicing, all right? I tend to use a lot of clonopin, clonazepam, because it, it tends to be longer acting and it, it gives coverage longer. And uh, I use a lot of lorazepam for catatonia. All right, so if someone has catatonia, lorazepam pretty much is the only evidence-based medication for that. And also lorazepam is not metabolized through the liver, so it tends to be a little bit less. It's, it's, it's metabolized in the liver, but it doesn't use sip enzyme. It, it uses phase two metabolism, which uses uh, glucuronidation, which is, makes it a little bit more water soluble. You don't have to know that for now, but 
just know that if someone has liver impairment, sometimes we use lorazepam a little bit better. All right. Catatonia, lorazepam. All right, Xanax, short acting for situational stuff, right? Flights. Someone's scared to get blood work. I do that sometimes too. If someone is very, you know, they have a phobia of needles and they need to get their blood work done. I'll give them a, a low dose of Xanax before the blood work, right? Just to get them to the office, I can get the blood work done. All right, or they're flying somewhere. All right. Okay, thank you. For anxiety disorders, you know the SSRIs usually are used. Believe it or not, SSRIs are actually better for anxiety than they are for depression. All right, I know we call them antidepressants, everyone calls them antidepressants, but they're actually, their effect size is much stronger for anxiety. They actually work better for anxiety than they work for depression. I think the effect size is like 0 0.4 for, for depression. It's like 0 0.6 for anxiety. And by the way, stimulants have an effect size above one, just so you guys can compare it. So effect size is, is a way statisticians determine how strong a medication is when you give it for a certain disorder, right? So if you give someone a stimulant, their effect size is above one, sometimes like 1 1.3, right? If you give someone an anesthetic, the effect size is even higher than that, right? How often do you give someone an anesthetic and they're gonna go to sleep, right? The effect size is much stronger. So if you give someone an SSRI for antidepressant, that's why people sometimes argue, you know, it's a placebo effect, right? Because the effect size is 0 0.4, it's moderate. Right? Anything, anything below 0 0.4 is like, mild effect size similar to like taking omega fatty acids right fish oils all right so obviously since you guys are prescribing ssris for anxiety also know the side effects of ssris the same way you would for depression right sexual dysfunction early activation induction of mania right sometimes weight gain gi side effects right because a lot of serotonin is in your stomach so that's something that you just counsel the patient on okay Know your medications that are inhibitors, right? BFT, big effing problems. B is bupropion. F is fluoxetin. P is paroxetine. If you're not aware that BFP can cause induct inhibitors, are inhibitors, you're going to have big effing problems, right? Because your patient is going to have side effects from the medication. Well, butrin, paroxetine, fluoxetin are inhibitors of multiple enzymes. So they can increase the dose of a lot of the medications. So be careful. Fluoxine is probably the most annoying because it has long half-life. So technically, if someone is on fluoxine for a couple months and the medication is steady state, even if they stopped fluoxine two weeks ago, they're still gonna need fluoxine in their system. So any medications that they take, you have to account for that fluoxine still being in the system. I'll give you an example, right? I had a patient that I wanted to start on Abilify because they were tearing up their house. The mom was like, yeah, give them something that's gonna calm them down, right? I think they were on the spectrum also. That's why I chose Abilify. The mom was like, oh yeah, the old psychiatrist put them on a medication for their anxiety and depression. Knowing the kid was like 11 or 10 years old, the mom couldn't remember the medication, but I assumed it was fluoxetine. So I made sure I started Abilify at two milligrams, right? What if I would have given that kid five milligrams? It would actually have been more. They would have probably had akathisia or EPS from it, right? Because the fluoxetine that they stopped a couple of weeks ago is still going to be in the system and it's going to keep increasing the Abilify, right? But guess what? Once the fluoxetine washes out, you're probably gonna have to adjust the Abilify because the Abilify dose is not gonna be enough anymore. Does that make sense, right? So for those first couple of weeks, but the fluoxetine is in the system, the Abilify is gonna be low. It's gonna be two milligrams, right? Once the fluoxetine washes out, the inhibition is gone. So what do you think is gonna happen to the plasma levels of the Abilify? It's gonna go down, so you're gonna have to adjust it. And then the mom says, hey, how come the meds stop working? Well, that's because the fluoxetine is out of the system. We have to adjust it now. Why do you want to adjust it? Well, the old medication, you have to explain it, right? Because then they're going to say, why are you trying to over-medicate my kid? Right? So you have to kind of give them an understanding of what you're going to have to do later on. I'm going to say, if I know that they were on fluoxetine, well, your kid was on fluoxetine. That's a medication that stayed in the system for about a month. It interferes the second medication that I'm giving with, right? It increased the levels. Therefore, I'm going to give them a very low dose of that medication, right? Once that, that first medication, the fluoxetine, washes out, I'm going to anticipate that the Bilify is probably going to drop down, right? And, and the, your kid is not going to respond to it. So I'm probably going to have to increase it, right? Because if you don't do that, you're probably going to get pushback from the family, right? Why are you increasing your meds, right? So to alleviate that headache, I'll probably just tell them up front what you're going to do, what the game plan is, right? That's the art of psychopharmacology, not just the science. Any other questions?
Can you go over the the CSTC circuit since that's in a lot of yes. things that we're reading? Okay. Yes. Yeah, so the CSTSC circuit, which is the cortical thalamo, which is the relay station, striatal, which is the movement back to the thalamus, right? Because it's the relay station back to the cortex, right? So I'll give you an example. Your cortex, you're thinking about, oh my God, if I touch that Nordom, it probably has a lot of germs in it, right? So you're going to touch the doorknob and you're going to activate your thalamus and your striatum, right? The movement of the striatum is you pulling your hand away, right? Again, it goes back to your thalamus, back to your cortex. And you wonder, oh my God, did I really wash my hands right? Because I touched that doorknob, that doorknob is nasty, right? So you wash your hands, all right? What happens over time is that's going to be impulsive in the beginning, right? So that's going to hit your ventral striatum, right? After a while of washing your hands over time, what happens is that movement becomes impulsive and it moves to compulsive. So what's going to happen is the connection is going to move from your ventral striatum to your dorsal striatum, right? Which is more, you know, kind of like when people do stuff and don't think about it, like when you're driving, right? That's your dorsal striatum. You're driving, you're not thinking about it, your cortex probably isn't working, right? But you're driving because that's that's your motor movement, right? Or walking is a better, better example. So CSTSC is the worry circuit. It's like a it's like a self fulfilling loop, right? You think about something and then reinforce it. Then you think about it, it makes it worse. Whether it's germs, whether it's intrusive thoughts, right? Intrusive thoughts can be you know. So sometimes the, one of the most common intrusive thoughts they say is like things that are very stigmatizing, right? You're a pedophile, right? Believe it or not, you are a pervert, or you're a slut, right? All these different things that are very stigmatized that people get in over that. That's why sometimes you interview a patient, you want to normalize it. And I'll say, hey, sometimes the most common, you know, um, thought that people have are, you know, you're a slut or you're gay or you're a pedophile. I'm just curious, does that cross your mind, right? Because if you mention that to a patient, it might kind of de-escalate. Oh, oh my God, other people feel that too. Yeah, you're right. You know, that's weird that you said that because I do get that, you know, but I'm not, I'm not a pedophile. You know, and, and it bothers me that every time I see a kid, there's a voice in my head that tells me I'm a pedophile. So what do you do? I go in my room, I lock the door, and I pray 10 times. All right, then I go outside the house, then I see someone else, and then the voice comes in my head again, I'm a pedophile. I go back to my room, and I pray for 10 times again. Or I wash my hands, right, because I'm washing my sins away, or whatever it is. All right, so see how it reinforces itself over and over again? So, of course, ERP works for that exposure, re-exposure prevention, right, which is through therapy. But sometimes someone's anxiety level goes up to like a 20 from a 10, right? And and their 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 um their fight or flight kicks in that they can't even, you know, they can't even slow that down. That the medication will help them. So you give them an SSRI, it does on the amygdala, right? At the same time, they're going to therapy. So you can't just give someone medication for OCD without therapy. It's not gonna work. So you have to tell the patient, look, I can give you medication, but you really have to find a good ERP specialist, right? Or a CBT therapist that specializes in CBT for OCD. Because if not, the medications are not going to work. And I don't want to fool you and say, we're going to keep increasing the dose of the meds and you're going to feel better. It's not going to work that way. So you might have to sell it and say, look, you have to go to therapy at the same time for the medications. If not, you're setting them up for failure, right? And they're going to blame you. Hey, you're a terrible prescriber, right? You're a terrible NP. How come you're giving me meds and it's not working? Well, I told you in the beginning that meds were only part of the problem, right? Part of the solution. You have to go to therapy at the same time, all right? Same as like medications for depression, right? If someone has... Cognitive distortions, right? Where every time they see someone, the distortion is, you know, I'm useless or I'm a failure or Professor Collado hates me. That's why he's doing this, right? I can give you medication for that. You're not going to change those thoughts unless you challenge it, right? So a therapist is going to say, is it possible that your friend ignored your phone call because they were busy? Is it possible that your friend ignored your phone call because they were dealing with things in their life, right? Is it possible Professor Collado, you know, did this? because of that, right? It's not because he was being a jerk, right? And you have to challenge that at the same time you're on medication. And it's, it's work, right? People would rather take, you know, a pill a morning after breakfast than go to CBT for an hour, right? It is a lot of work. But I tell patients, the good news is that, you know, if you do the therapy and you get good at like, learning those skills or unlearning those negative coping skills, there's a chance you might be able to reduce your dose drastically of medication, right? Less side effects, or we can get you off of medication, right? So that's the plan. Not that you're going to medicate someone for, you know, 10 years for OCD. That's not going to help anybody. Sorry, I can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. 
So that pathway is kind of reiterating the behaviors like over. Yes, and that's why it's called the worry loop, right? You worry, mm -hmm. what you worry about makes you more scared, you worry even more, right? Then, then it becomes motor, goes, goes through your, your striatum and you either escape. Let's say for instance, the worry loop, worry loop is like, oh my God, I don't wanna leave outside because I have social anxiety or so, right? If I go outside, people are gonna judge me or they're gonna think that I'm a failure or whatever, right? So you go outside, you step out for a few seconds, someone looks at you the wrong way, you run back inside your house, all right? Then you feel a little bit of relief, but then what happens is you don't go to work anymore. You stop going to school and then you end up not doing anything. So that, it kind of like reinforces itself. With the um, ADHD though, I see it in like the hyperactivity is that's because it's reinforcing the fidgeting that they're getting relief yes, from? It hits the striatum. It hits the striatum. Yeah. The, the reason why that's emphasized too is because sometimes we're moving away from a diagnosis based like system talking about like if someone has OCD, you prescribe them that, right? Or someone has ADHD, you prescribe them that. The good thing about Stahl's approach is that it's a circuit-based approach, right? So it goes by symptom. If you have inattention, it doesn't mean, it doesn't matter if it's inattention from ADHD, inattention from treatment resistant depression, inattention from other stuff, right? It's that circuit, it's your dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex that needs tuning with dopamine norepinephrine as opposed to the diagnosis, if that makes sense. That's the reason why they're mentioning that the CSTSC loop is implicated in hyperactivity, right? Because it's a motor disorder, right? Someone is, you know, move, move, doing the same behaviors, which is why sometimes you, you can't tell, right? If someone is running away from something because they have intrusive thoughts and running away could be from phobia or intrusive thoughts of, you know, the world is going to end or whatever, it might look like hyperactivity from ADHD. And that's fine because it's the same circuit that's working. Does that make sense? It's still hyperactive CSTSC loop, right? You can... Treat that different ways. You can give them an SSRI, right? That might help slow down that loop a little bit, right? You might give them an alpha-2 agonist that, that might help with that loop also. You might give them a dopamine blocker, right? That might calm that down also. You might give them a 5-C2A antagonist that might calm them. See what I'm saying? It, you're understanding the pathway of the loop, but you're understanding how the other neurotransmitters might help that, right? How can other neurotransmitters help with, you know, tuning the frontal lobe, right? You can increase norepinephrine. How come giving someone atomoxetine or veloxetine also increased dopamine in the frontal lobe? Why does it do that? Because there's no dopamine reuptake pumps in the frontal lobe, right? Or very little. So dopamine and norepinephrine share the same pump, right? So in the frontal lobe, you only have norepinephrine transfer pumps that, that also suck up dopamine. So in essence, if you give someone a norepinephrine transport inhibitor, you're also blocking norepinephrine transport inhibition in the frontal lobe. So you're keeping dopamine there also. So you're not only keeping dopamine, but you're also keeping norepinephrine, right? Because they rely on both pumps to get sucked back in. Does that make sense? Yeah. Do they have an equal affinity for the receptor or is it like one over the other? Interestingly enough, I think it actually ha has higher affinity for dopamine than norepinephrine in the frontal lobe. Yeah. Can you please review the fear circuit? So the fear pathway is, is more of the amygdala, but there's also other parts there. There's the PAG, which is the periactical gray, which has to do with hyperventilation, right? Breathing mm -hmm. fast. Um, sorry. Allergies. Um, there's the, I don't know. I can, what are the, what's the other part? I can't remember. I, I thought I that know. was a parabrachial nucleus. For breathing? The locus, locus ceruleum. Okay. And then the acronym gray was avoidance. Okay, then you're right. Whatever the book says, I'm sorry, I'm I'm out of it. I was like, I... say it again, say it again. So, I only remember it because I remember the B in parabrachial nucleus for breathing. So that oh, one's very good. Aspirations, and then the periaqueal gray. I remember the A in that one for like avoidance. Okay. Very good. Okay. Excellent. Good job. And what about the locus ceruleum? So that's your fight or flight response. Locus ceruleus spits out norepinephrine, right? So locus ceruleus innervates a lot of your other parts of your brain. So if locus ceruleus is spitting out too much norepinephrine, you're going to have an excitatory response, right? A fight mm -hmm. or flight response, right? That's why you give someone a, you know, alpha two agonist, right? Because what's going to happen? It's going to downregulate those alpha receptors over time. This is a good concept, actually, right? Why do you think if you give someone a Fexor, 
or duloxetine, which is SNRI, which is increasing norepinephrine. Why am I giving someone norepinephrine if I'm going to help with anxiety? Why do you think that is? Because I want to downregulate those postsynaptic norepinephrine receptors, right? That's why when you give someone SNRI in the beginning, they're going to have activation, right? You go, oh my God, I'm so anxious. Why do you think that sometimes we offer them a benzo short term, right? I say, look, I'm going to give you a Fexor in the beginning. It might make your anxiety worse. But to make you comfortable through the whole titration process, I might give you Ativan, you know, PRN as needed or Clonopin daily or, or as needed too, just to get you through it. Because over time, what happens is those receptors from the SNRI, norepinephrine is also not going to get, it's going to stay in the cleft, right? So that means more norepinephrine is going to bind to those alpha-2 receptors, right? The alpha receptors. Eventually, it's going to make you a little nervous, right? A little anxious. But over time, it's going to downregulate and then it's going to get better, right? Same as the alpha-2 agonist, right? With the guanfacine. You're giving someone alpha-2 agonist postsynaptically, when it's hitting the norepinephrine receptor postsynaptically, it's going to downregulate that receptor over time, and then therefore they're not going to have a, a high response to it, right? Does that make sense? It's downregulation, upregulation, like I said, going back to that same concept. That's why you give them a medication that's going to downregulate those receptors to help alleviate the anxiety, right? So it's downregulation of norepinephrine receptors to help with anxiety, all right? It's downregulation of serotonin receptors postsynaptically that help with depression in a general sense. There's no questions on the PBN and paracetal gray. So don't waste your time memorizing. I'm sorry. I know you I know you memorize the Haley. It's good for you to know, but I'm since I wrote this test, there's a lot of there's less definition questions. I'll just say it's a lot more clinical questions. It's you applying concepts. All right. I read, by the way, I took your constructive criticism and, and you know, I, I appreciate what you guys said and thank you for saying. I, 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 as a student, I do empathize with you that I would be annoyed too if my professor was teaching me and didn't write the questions. So I took time out and I wrote all the questions for you. Be careful what you wish for. I hope you guys don't hate me afterwards, but it's high level thinking those questions, right? The questions you complained about. I studied all this for the first exam and I didn't get those type of questions. Well, you're gonna get those questions now, right? Clinical questions. Patient comes to your office, this is happening. What do you do next? All right, things that you'll probably need as a, as a, as a practitioner, right? There's some definition questions, but not many. A lot of them will be application of concepts, pharmacokinetic questions, pharmacodynamic questions, right? Down regulation, up regulation, inhibition, all right? Induction, what happens to the medications when they get induced? What is a prodrug? What is a partial agonist? What is an antagonist? What would happen if I block 5-HC2A receptors? What would happen if I agonize 5-HC1A receptors, right? So are, still, yes. are, are we still focusing on three books, you would say, on the stall, on the ender, and the other one? I would probably focus on the stall concepts because the ender book is really not going to do you so good on this test. Because like I said, ender is a psychologist and I it. I don't doesn't know anything <laughs> about psychiatry. I'll just say that. Right. And I want you guys, to, the reason why I teach this class is I want you guys to be great prescribers, not even good, I want you guys to be great prescribers. So by understanding the concepts, you're going to be on your road to be great prescribers, all right? Inhibition, induction, all right? Inhibitors, pathways, what do the receptors do? That's what you need to prescribe appropriately for people. Not so there's going to be questions that um, from the content from the first exam as well? No, I did not repeat any questions from the first exam. I mean... Maybe with the in, with the with the uh, SIP enzymes, maybe if there was one in the first exam, I don't remember the first exam clear, but there is definitely questions about SIP enzymes in the second exam. No, the main one: three, four, two D six, one A two, two C nine, two C nineteen, two B six. All right, one A two, two B six, three A four, two C nine, two C nineteen, and did I miss one. There's only six of them: three, four, two D six, one A two. You know, the regular ones that we use in psych, right? The same ones I keep memorizing, repeating. In psych, 2D6 is the most used one. So most likely, if you're not sure, it's probably 2D6 medication. The majority of the psych meds are 2D6, if you're not sure. Do you want us to know specific receptors for, like, specific drugs? Or is kind of, like, atypical in what 
Uh, and is specific drugs. I'm not that cool, but know what what makes something atypical and what makes something typical, and know what okay. the regular side effects are of a typical medication, which is metabolic, and know which ones are right. Know metabolic syndrome, right? There's a few questions on metabolic syndrome, right? Metabolic syndrome you would assess for by blood pressure. Remember the mnemonic I told you guys: fats, HATS, blood pressure is going to be elevated. H is HDL is going to be low. A is going to be adipose tissue, right? Remember, not the waist circumference, it's actually the adipose tissue, right? Because what are, what's on the belly button is what's the most worrisome. T is triglycerides, it's going to be elevated, and S stands for sugar, right? So fasting blood glucose is going to be elevated, right? Triglycerides is going to be high. So those are how you assess for metabolic syndrome. And that most likely will probably be atypical antipsychotics, usually. So I have a question. I'm not I'm not currently working in psych. I'm in med search. So when I have a patient with a psych history, I get really excited. Uh, for the past two days, um, I've been feeding this patient nonstop. And, you know, we were learning about antipsychotics, the 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 tip, atypicals with the metabolic. Mm -hmm. So I could have sworn that he was on one of those because I was feeding him nonstop, but it was actually sertraline and Xanax. And I was just wondering, like, because I didn't see the metformin, I didn't see anything like for, you know, like prophylactic, like you explained, but it was actually sertraline and Xanax. So I was confused as to why he was eating so much. I mean, sertraline doesn't cause a metabolic syndrome, syphilis, or atypical antipsychotic. Sertraline can cause, you know, weight gain by itself. It could be a separate issue. The person could have binge eating disorder. I mean, there's not enough information to say, but to answer your question, you know, I wouldn't put someone at metformin who gained weight on SSRIs, right? It's not evidence-based and there's nothing to back you up. Mm -hmm. I've got that question before and a lot of like, you know, like when I do consults and stuff, they'll say, hey, someone gained a lot of weight in lithium. How do you feel about putting someone on metformin? I say, I wouldn't do it because there's no evidence behind it. And lithium is toxic to the kidneys. And guess what? Metformin is also toxic to the kidneys. So especially if the patient is older, I want to make sure the GFR is okay. I wouldn't do that unless I was consulting with, you know, an internist or someone else in medicine to make sure that's okay for the patient because it wouldn't be evidence-based, right? The only evidence-based really is adding metformin to atypical antipsychotics. There's a lot of evidence behind that and a lot of guidelines behind that too. Metformin to, to help with weight gain for everything else is theoretical at best and I wouldn't do it. Even though some people take metformin to like, I know people are getting married to take metformin, but that was before... Uh, Ozempic got popular, so now it's Ozempic. But before I used to be metformin, people would take to lose weight or stimulants, Vivens. Are they using Ozempic now with like olanzapine and stuff like that, or just like Lobavi, or is that really? That's a good question. Um, we were, I was doing rounds actually, and uh, one of the psychiatrists was like, "Why are you prescribing metformin? Let's just give them Ozempic." I'm like, "Doc, I'm like." you serious? Like who's going to pay for them? Patient can't afford that, you know? So from a practical standpoint, you know, who's going to, they're not going to pay for that. You can't even get Ozempic now for, if you have an indication for it, right? It's a very expensive medication, maybe in the future, but right now it's not practical, right? There's many meds that wish they could prescribe medications, but we're hindered by, you know, practicality, right? They can't afford it. Insurance sucks or whatever. You have to be able to work around that, unfortunately. There is studies now for Ozempic for uh, mood stream resistant mood disorders. So if you look up uh, Dr. McIntyre, M-C-I-N-T-Y-R-E, he's doing studies now for GLP agonists to help with patients who are not responding to treatment for bipolar 2 disorder. Studies, you know, I mean, it's still early on, but right now the studies are pretty positive, so it's pretty good, yeah, but we'll see. But remember, mood dis treatment resistant mood disorder is linked to inflammation, right? So. A lot of GLP-1 agonists, it will decrease inflammation. So if someone's not responding and you know, they're overweight, you know, part of our job is to, is to teach them about healthy eating and exercise because that will also help them feel better and they might respond better to the medication, all right? Believe it or not, a lot of adipose tissue or a lot of inflammation when people are obese, for some reason, their receptors don't work the same. So they don't respond the same way to antidepressants, right? Just by losing weight, they, they respond better. I know it's hard to say chicken or the egg because if someone's depressed, how can you encourage them to go to Planet Fitness, right? But you have to work together somehow. For someone has schizophrenia, right? Who's very paranoid. You want them to exercise and eat healthy, but they're paranoid. They don't want, they only eat certain foods because they're paranoid, right? So you have to kind of like work together. It's challenging. I mean, psych is very challenging. But it has to be a team approach for this stuff. Can you give an example of something that you would ask about one of the specific enzymes? 
an example. Or just like how we should be thinking about it, I guess. I can't give an example. I'm going to give away the test question. I'll give you an example. I give you someone is on drug X, right? All of a sudden starts developing side effects from drug X. I'm going to give you a bunch of other medications that might be inhibitors, and you have to tell me which one there is. Right? Is it fluoxetine? Is it Lexapro? Is it sertraline? You know what I mean? You have to know the answer would be fluoxetine. Know what the AIMS exam is. I think I talked about it in schizophrenia. AIMS is for tardive dyskinesia testing, right? Abnormal and voluntary movement scale, right? You need to be doing that every three months with someone on antipsychotic medications. AIMS, A I M S. Abnormal and voluntary movement scale checks for tardive dyskinesia. If they score a certain amount of points and they do meet criteria for tardive dyskinesia, you will put them on what? What type of inhibitor? VMAT. VMAT inhibitor, right? Valbenazine. Or do tetrabenazine, all right? The VMAT for VMAT for tardive dyskinesia works a little bit differently than the VMAT for amphetamines, right? So amphetamines it actually reverses VMAT, right? Because it makes it spit out. For the tardive dyskinesia medication, it just it doesn't make it reverse, so therefore it's not going to increase dopamine, right? What's going to happen is it's going to stop dopamine from going inside the vesicle. It's going to kill off dopamine, right? Because remember. Tardive, like I said last time, tardive dyskinesia is a hyper dopaminergic state, right? Because you, you have very sensitive receptors and you have up, upregulated receptors, right? So every time dopamine secretes, it's going to cause spastic movements, right? Because you have upregulated and very sensitive receptors. So how do you stop that? You decrease dopamine by stopping dopamine from being recycled, right? If you stop the VMAP pump, dopamine is not going to go inside the vesicle. And therefore, free dopamine was going to get eaten up by monoamine oxidase, right? So you're actually going to have less dopamine. But what's the risk of that? EPS. Right? You, you decrease dopamine too much, you go too high in the VMAT inhibitor, you might give someone, you know, dystonia or Parkinsonism. Get it? But unfortunately, you know, it's a tough balance. You have to kind of like balance it out and ask the patient which one is worse, the, the tardive dyskinesia or the dystonia. And you let them choose, unfortunately. Do you have anyone on like low doses of both at the same time? You can. You can. I have. Yeah, in the past I have. I have. But to be honest with you, it's very hard to treat one fully. So they're going to have residual symptoms. Because if you try to push it one way, it's kind of like seesaw, right? You have to balance it both ways. If you go too high on one, it's going to get off balance, and they're going to have more abnormal movements from the target dyskinesia. If you go too much on one, and they're going to have you know more EPS. So you kind of have to find the balance where there's less EPS and less target dyskinesia, and they're both kind of like in a happy balance where they're not as impeding as the other ones. But from my experience and from other colleagues too, it's very hard to get rid of all of it if they have both. Right, because it's one's gonna worsen the other, unfortunately. It's like having Parkinson's syndrome, it's psychosis, right? You block too much dopamine, they're not gonna have hallucination, but you block too much dopamine, now they're not able to move as freely, right? Now they're able to move as freely because you increase the dopamine, right? Because you're helping the Parkinsonism, but now it's increasing dopamine in the mesolimbic area and they're having psychosis. Right. So unfortunately, it's like uh, you know, they have to choose what's worse, the movement or the or the voices. You'd be surprised. Some patients pick, you'd be surprised what the patients pick. Some will say, it's okay, I'm all right with the voices. Some will say, I don't care about movement. The voices are, are too much for me. I can't sleep. You'll leave it up to them. But you'll, you'll usually see that with patients who are chronically sick and you know they're already like been in and out of the hospital numerous times already. I saw that a lot when I was inpatient. I don't see that a lot as outpatient right now. Any other questions? This is like your review for the for the next exam. So if you have any questions, ask me now. We're not gonna do a formal review for it. So this could be like a review if you have you want me to repeat everything. Obviously, I'm not gonna tell you what's exactly in the test, but I probably gave you about 70% of what's already on it from what I just mentioned today. I guess about. So if you give an antipsychotic and then it, you already have negative symptoms prior to that. Now you're exacerbating the negative symptoms in the mesocortical area. Does, yeah, you're would, you, yeah. would you 
supplement with like an antidepressant or something to increase you know, it's negative it. symptoms, right? No, it's not going to work. But if you thought it was negative symptoms, it was actually depression, then yes, it would work. Okay. And it's hard to tell sometimes. Sometimes you just have to kind of give the treatment and see. And then if it doesn't work, then, you know. I would probably try Wellbutrin before I do an SSRI because Wellbutrin will increase dopamine a little bit more and not worsen psychosis. And I've had some success with that. So it's not necessarily like the serotonin because it's the frontal lobe that's increasing the dopamine. Yeah, frontal lobe, you uh, it. yeah tuning your frontal lobe tends to be more norepinephrine dopamine. Yeah, but not as much serotonin. Yeah. Serotonin pathways tend to work more towards worrying, the CSTIC like we talked about, and the amygdala pathway, right? Fear, fear response, phobias. Or depression. Is anyone on here for the first time because they couldn't make the early sessions? I'm curious. No. One of the critiques of the students was that it wasn't fair that I was always doing morning lectures. So I did one at night to accommodate some people. But tried. Question. So if you're blocking dopamine in the mesolympic meso area, then um, basically the patient is more at risk of having um, negative side effects due to the fact that um, dopamine is going to be decreased in a um, mesocortical area. Yes, because when you give a medication, right, your intention is for it to block dopamine only in the mesolimbic area. But since medications are free dispersing in the brain, right, we can't control which compartment of the brain they work in. If it leaks, if enough of it leaks into the mesocortical area, yes, it will cause, you know, secondary symptoms from medication. Like we call it secondary negative symptoms, right? Secondary because it wasn't there before. The medication worsened there or caused it, right? It was <laughs> primary. It was there before the medication. You just have to treat it. Uh -huh. In that case, um, would um, Abilify be like a the, like the best option for that? Uh, why? You tell me. Why would Abilify be the best option for that? Because it's a um partial agonist. So um, if dopamine is like um, there's a lot of dopamine in the mesolimbic area, can you know okay. bring it to. Can anyone answer as to when Abilify wouldn't be effective? And if that was the case, I would just give everyone Abilify and they would get better, right? Mm -hmm. Anyone want to try? Do you need like more? Do you need more like dopamine, like saturation? Like yeah, I mean, yeah, like, you need more dopamine like yeah. That's what I mean. Like like an eighty percent or something. Correct. Yeah, because if you need to get eighty percent dopamine blockade, Abilify doesn't go that much. It, it maxes out at seventy five. So. If the patient only needs 75% or less than that, yeah. If someone needs 70%, sure, Abilify will work. But if they need more than that, unfortunately, Abilify. Which is why I usually try to use Abilify first, right? Because it's, it tends to be mildest. You know, it only blocks 75%. You know, besides akathisia, it tends to have less EPS, less weight gain, even though it can still cause weight gain. So I try to get patients on that. First. I guess the mistake is don't use Abilify if someone's already failed on like three medications, right? Someone's been a risk for own, you know, Abilify is not going to cut it. You know, it's like once you've gone to Italy and you've eaten like fresh Italian pizza, you're gonna go back to Ilio's pizza? Probably not. Throw it in the garbage, right? It's not gonna taste the same. So, Abilify is reserved for usually first episode, right? First time being on meds. With the, um, sorry, the GABA receptor, I know that it's made up of this, what, five different components. Do you what want us to know, do you want us to know what all five appointments or just that, the about the chloride and 
like that kind of thing. Well, if you ask me if I want you to know, yes, I would love for you guys to know that, but yeah. At this point in your career, it, it's, you know, eventually I would love you guys to know that. So just know right now, chloride will go inside the cell, you know, cause it to, you know, become more negative, right? And it will stop the chance of the cell depolarizing. Therefore, it'll help with anxiety and help with seizures. All right. So chloride challenge. Remember, just the benzos are not GABA agonists, all right? They're not GABA agonists. They're positive allosteric modulators, which means that there's a, another site next to the GABA receptor. So you need, that's the key there. You need both to bind to the receptor at the same time for the chloride channels to open. So for instance, if it gives, even though, I don't know what circumstances would happen, but if you gave someone Xanax, for instance, right? And the Xanax is bound to that positive allosteric modulator, right, on the side. But GABA isn't binding to that receptor, the chloride channel is not going to open and therefore you, there's not going to be an anti-anxiety effect. Right, so you need both to be in place for it to work. You need the medication there, and you also need natural occurring GABA to, to be on there. What's the difference between barbiturates and benzodiazepines? With with the uh, opening of the receptors, they both open the Which, receptor. What's, barbiturates what's bind directly to the receptor. Say that again. What binds directly to the receptor? Barbiturates. So they, they still bind to this, another site, but what happens, they increase the duration of the opening. So if you give someone a barbiturate, like phenobarbital, for instance, the, the receptor is gonna open up more and stay open and, and uh, chloride is gonna go in more frequently, right? Uh, benzodiazepine, it's an increase the free, even though it's tomato, tomato, increases the frequency, it opens more and closes more, but there is tends to be, maybe it's because of the duration of it being opening longer is why people have more you know, deaths with barbiturates, right? More respiratory depression. Because I guess more chloride goes in and causes more short depression. But we don't really use barbiturates too much anymore. Yeah. Fun fact, they used to use barbiturates in the Salem witch trials. You hear about that? They if the, if you were a witch, they would give you barbiturates. They thought you were a witch, right? And if you were a manic and you responded, then you were fine, right? Also, the um, if, if you are if they threw you in the water and apparently if you if you drowned, you weren't a witch and it was fine. If you survived, they thought you were a witch, they would drag you out and they would light you on fire. Interesting, right? Psychiatry is, is so much better now. They don't do that anymore. They just give people medications now. I have a question about the, the pathways. Mm -hmm. um, I know in someone that's schizophrenic, the dopamine is high in the mesolimbic and low in the mesocortical. Are the other two pathways um, in normal? excess? Sorry? Uh, usually not. No, usually not. Usually okay, so they're like normal. Yeah. They're and then normal. if you yeah, bring them down too much. Okay. But someone can have too much dopamine in the nigrostrial area for schizophrenia too. And those are the ones that you see with psychomotor agitation, right? They go to the ER. They're disorganized. They might be punching. Not that they're they're just angry for no reason. It's probably because there's too much dopamine in the nigrostrial area. So that can happen too. Because one of the questions I was reading, I think it was from Edinger maybe, but it said the dopamine hypothesis proposes that there's excessive dopamine in the striatum and mesolimbic pathways. So I didn't understand. Oh that. yeah, the striatum. Well, going back to what I said, right? The nigrostriatal is a striatum. Because there's too much okay. dopamine in the fact that people are more, sometimes people can be more aggressive, right? Because there's too much dopamine there. So in essence, you know, you, when you give someone a dopamine blocker, you do want to block a little bit in nigrostriatal, a little bit, not too much, right? Remember the threshold, if they go above 80, there's EPS there. So if you can keep it below 80, you're usually safe. As you get advanced, like I'll give you an example, treatment resistant schizophrenia, I have patients with clozapine, but still have residual negative symptoms, right? And I max out the clozapine, let's say at like 300 milligrams a day, right? Clozapine level is 400. When I go higher, they tend to have more drooling, they're more sedated, they don't like it, right? But their psychosis is gone, their positive symptoms are gone, but they still have like negative symptoms and I don't want to give them a stimulant because I don't want to worsen it. I do have them an hour of to help with residual negative symptoms, right? Why do you think that, why do you think I can do that with not other medications? Why can I add abilify to clozapine and it plays nicely? Why did I tell you about clozapine? It doesn't really affect the dopamine receptor, right? Only blocks 20 to 40%. So you can give someone, so with clozapine, it's in the, its mechanism is not really dopamine blockade. You can compete at the dopamine receptor with other medications. Because like I said, 
it works like cholinergic receptors, cholinergic agonists, maybe TAR1 agonists too. It doesn't compete at it. So sometimes you'll see patients who are very sick on clozapine and a very strong D2 blocker, right? like Haldol or Fufenazine or Risperidone. Or you might see them on clozapine and Abilify, right? And they don't compete with each other. But what happens if you give someone Risperidone, let me say you give someone Olanzapine and Abilify, they're going to compete at the D2 receptor in the mesolimbic area, right? One of them is only one of them can bind to the receptor. And, and it just so happens that Abilify has higher affinity. So the Abilify will bounce off the Olanzapine. Right? I'm giving you an example, right? Someone doesn't understand fundamentals, right? They didn't take my class, right? And someone is on olanzapine and they put them on Abilify 5 and someone's on high dose of olanzapine 20. Number one, if you just stop the olanzapine, they're going to have antiphological withdrawal, like I told you before, right? Once you give someone Abilify, that Abilify has higher affinity. It's going to bounce off that olanzapine right away in the mesolimbic area. So what's going to happen? It's almost like they're not taking the olanzapine. It's almost like the olanzapine was never given to them. Even though they're taking it, the abilify is going to bind more strongly than the mesolimbic area. They're going to have rebound psychosis. I see that a lot, right? Patient on olanzapine and someone puts them on abilify and the patient's aggressive, they're more psychotic, right? And they get much worse. That's because the abilify is bouncing off the uh, the olanzapine, the olanzapine the, the already. Only two can be in the receptors. Can you repeat the... um? The clozapine, like I know that you said it's only like 20, 40% because it doesn't go the whole pathway. So why would you add another um, like typical psycho? Uh... Because I want to work, I want it to work in the mesocortical area. I want to give Abilify to increase dopamine in the mesocortical area. Because I know this person's, even if the, even if Abilify is going to be in the mesolimbic area, it's not going to compete with clozapine. The Abilify can block 75% of the dopamine in the mesolimbic area. It doesn't matter because this person's schizophrenia or psychosis is not responsive to dopamine blockade anyway. So I put the clozapine there that's working for the positive symptoms, right? Because like I said, they're stable, but they still have residual negative symptoms. So I'm giving them a partial agonist because remember, like I said, people with schizophrenia don't have enough dopamine in the frontal lobe, right? So I'm giving them a partial agonist because the partial agonist is going to work as a net agonist when there's not enough dopamine, right? Okay, thank you. And also partial agonists are least likely to cause hyperprolactinemia because of partial agonists. So if someone has a history of hyperprolactinemia and they can't tolerate a full antagonist or let's say risperidone, I can either switch them fully to a partial agonist like aripiprazole, or I can add a low dose of aripiprazole, very low, not enough that it's going to compete with the risperidone to kind of balance it out. But that's tricky also, be careful. Because like I said, if you go too high, it's going to bounce off that risperidone, the person's going to be too psychotic. So maybe... If someone's stable on like four milligrams of risperidone, right, has no psychosis, but is having hypoplactinemia, it's a female, wants to get pregnant and hasn't had a period in like six months, I would add maybe two milligrams of aripiprazole and monitor her and make sure her psychosis doesn't come back. And then maybe in two months, we check her prolactin. And most of the time, the prolactin normalizes, right? But she has to be in two antipsychotics. A bill of low dose to increase dopamine in the tuberoinfundibular area, right? Which is too low when someone's prolactin is up. And at the same time, I don't want to override the mesolimbic area and give them, let's say, 10 milligrams of Abilify, and it's going to bounce off that risperidone because it has a higher affinity. Right? Any other questions? I'll go for another 10 minutes if you guys want. Like I said, this is a review. So if you have any other questions not clear, ask me now. Can you go over the um, phenotizing? Uh, phenotizing? Phenotyazines like clopromazine? Yeah. Okay. So there's a few classes of meds that are called phenothiazines. You know, just to keep it simple, phenothiazines is, is a class of medication um, that's similar to clopromazine that have very strong anticholinergic antihistamine properties. Now you're wondering, clopromazine is a first generation antipsychotic. How can it be a strong antihistamine anticholinergic, right? It's one of the exceptions. All right. Usually, First generation typical antipsychotics are not really strong antihistamine, anticholinergic medications. That's why they, they, they don't have anything to protect them from EPS. But clopromazine is one of the few meds, right? Clopromazine is a first generation antipsychotic, but it does have strong antihistamine, anticholinergic. So it can cause a lot of weight gain, can cause a lot of sedation. It does cause a lot of QTC prolongation. It's also a very strong alpha blocker. So it can cause orthostatic hypotension. 
which is why we don't really use chlorpromazine that much in psychiatry anymore because people bottom out, right? You give them too much chlorpromazine, they sit, they sit up from the chair and they, and they, they pass out because of autostatic hypotension, all right? Or there are other medications that prolong QTC and all of a sudden the person has a rhythm, right? QTC should be, a, should be below 500, right? Usually we want to keep it like around 450 or 475, all right? Once it's above 500, you have to, you know, do EKGs and, and adjust the medication. All right, why is QTC prolongation dangerous? Because it can cause torsades, right? Torsades of the quant means that the atrium and the ventricle are misfiring. The ventricle actually starts firing a little bit faster than the atrium and the person's not gonna get enough perfusion. It's gonna cause a ventricle, uh, it's gonna cause a blood perfusion problem. Did I answer your question? Phenothiazine, the only one you need to know is chlorpromazine. That's the most common phenothiazine that we use in psychiatry. It's a first generation antipsychotic. It causes a lot of, it can cause antihistamine, anticholinergic withdrawal also, be careful with that. So weight gain, orthostatic hypotension, sedation, EKG uh, changes, QTC prolongation, all right? Clopromazine was actually the first antipsychotic that was created, created in 1952 by accident, by uh, by a surgeon who was trying to find a medication to help people undergo anesthesia. Then he realized that all the patients that were psychotic that he gave clopromazine, miraculously their, their psychosis went away. So that's how he found it, right? Interesting. Before that, they were using insulin coma, lobotomies, all that stuff that you guys saw in the first, the first test, that, that, that question. Can you go over five H, five H two like the two A serotonin and how it's inverse to the what is it the one A? Like yes. how they... So you have five H two A, which is considered a dopamine break, right? And you have five H T one A, which is considered a dopamine accelerator, right? So if you give someone serotonin and it hits a five H two A receptor, right, so it's the break. You're stepping on the brakes. Dopamine is going to go down, right? So for instance, you give someone an SSRI and it innervates 5 ac 2 a too much, that patient might have flat affect, right? That's why people have apathy syndrome with SSRIs, right? Because you're hitting 5 ac 2 a too much, you're cutting off dopamine release in the stride, in the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. Someone all of a sudden doesn't feel pleasure, they feel flat, they might look depressed, right? So what you can do sometimes is you can give someone a 5 ac 1 a partial agonist like Buspar, Buspirone, right? Because 5 ac one a is a dopamine accelerator. So that increased dopamine in the frontal lobe and increased pleasure or help with sexual side effects. That's why boost bar is added sometimes to SSRIs because if an SSRI is hitting 5 ac 2 a too much, right? And that's cutting off dopamine and causing sexual dysfunction. You can give them boost bar, which is a dopamine break. So you're hoping that by that mean accelerator, you're pushing down harder and the accelerator you're going to override the breaks, right? So if you give someone enough 5 ac one a agonist or partial agonist, it's going to override the 5 ac 2 a agonist that you're getting. Right? Ideally, you can give them a 5 ac 2 a antagonist and a 5 ac one a partial agonist at the same time, like trazodone or mirtazapine or quetiapine, right? Those are meds that are 5 ac 2 a antagonist and 5 ac one a partial agonist at the same time. Is that clear? Does that make sense? Know that metformin, long-term metformin use can cause depletion of B12 and folate, All right? That's important because if you're adding metformin to someone who's an antipsychotic medication, all of a sudden they start developing depression. Remember, you need B12 and folate to make your neurotransmitters, right? So if someone is an antipsychotic and you put, put them at the serolanzapine, you put them on metformin for a while and all of a sudden they start seeing they have depression. I, before I put them on SSRI, I probably would do a B12 folate level first especially if they're vegan, right? Because vegan, they don't eat eggs, they don't eat meats, they don't, there's, there's no good source of B12 there. Sorry for any vegans out there. Apologize. Yeah. Any other questions? Will there be questions on um, autism? I don't know. I'm not sure if you want to 
tell us that. Uh, no, I didn't put any questions on autism because you know you're not gonna treat that as yeah. There's no questions on autism, but you should know what I mentioned about you know some of the general signs of it. Okay. Oh, know that um, stimulus can also induce ticks. Ticks, right? You guys don't know what ticks are? Repetitive movements, right? So sometimes if someone develops a tick from a stimulant, you can either stop the stimulant or you can add an alpha 2 agonist, right? Because alpha 2 agonists can help with ticks also. So sometimes I'll add guanfacine and it'll help keep them on the stimulant without the ticks happening, right? If they can't tolerate the stimulant, the ticks get really worse, I would probably stop the stimulant and just put them on alpha 2 agonist and try to maximize that. What's the difference between a tick and tardive dyskinesia? How do you know? It's a good question. How can you tell well, if someone has a tick or tardive dyskinesia? One knows, someone knows that it's happening, like they're aware of it. Okay, that's another one. But what about the movement? How does it look? One, one is rhythmic, one is non-rhythmic. Which one is rhythmic? A tick is rhythmic. Okay. Tardive dyskinesia is non-rhythmic. It can, it can come in different, you know, like their movement will come in different rhythms, you know? Like a tick is usually rhythmic and usually they can suppress it and they're aware of it, like you said, right? Tired of dyskinesia, a person has no awareness of it. And they can have both. So it's not one or the other. Someone can have ticks and tired of dyskinesia and you have to distinguish between both. And you might have to treat both. Usually I'll refer people to movement disorders because you know they're more experienced with that than me and they can distinguish which one is which. So usually I'll, re I'll refer them to a neurologist who's a movement disorder specialist and I'll follow their recommendations of whatever they think is causing it and how we should treat it. Any other questions? So there's 50 questions, right? It's, it's equally distributed with schizophrenia, maybe a little bit more schizophrenia than everything else, but anxiety is on there too, and ADHD is on there too. Pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics, inhibitors, um, scenarios of like patients, you know, presenting with this, uh, receptors, right? Which receptor, you know, if this receptor gets antagonized, what are some things you should look for, right? Side effects of, of medications are on there also, general side effects, right? Not just headache and nausea, which every medication causes, very specific side effects you should know, right? Like metabolic symptoms from atypicals, uh, motor dysfunction with typicals, right? Because it, it's more EPS, akathisia, and those things are on there, all right? All right, good luck. If you have any other questions, you can email me, all right? Have a nice weekend. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.